hatchery now and why would those funds why would those not con continue into the future and apply to fall creek i just information thank you absolutely yeah um Iron Gate Hatchery was constructed as a mitigation hatchery for the habitat lost between Iron Gate and Copco. And it's funded by Pacific Ore, who owns the project and the hydroelectric dams. As part of the hydroelectric settlement agreement that was signed back in 2010 and amended in 2016, Pacific Core's obligations to fund hatchery operations will continue for an eight year period beyond dam removal. But beyond that window, there's uncertainty associated with funding. And so it's really on the agencies to first, to, first, first and foremost, evaluate the need for hatchery operations beyond those eight years. And that really calls for the need for an extensive monitoring program. And if we're not meeting our conservation objectives, for example, of Fall Chinook, the question has to be asked, do we need to continue hatchery operations beyond those eight years? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Further questions? Danny Evanson, then Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Mr. Day, for driving down here and being here in person. It's nice to see you again. I had a question on uh, slide 12. Um, I haven't really tracked this project that closely because these fish don't swim up to Alaska and I guess we're lucky because that would add constraints. But um, on, uh, I do have a soft spot for this uh, drainage as you know. Uh, so on slides 12 you, uh, in the drawdown section, you briefly touched on um, rescue relocation. Is that, juvenile rescue relocation, or is it adult rescue relocation? You mentioned earlier in your presentation that uh, adult fish will be imprinted on the hatchery proper, and I'm wondering uh, what the approach is for that and if it's juvenile or adults. It's, it's juveniles, Danny. And so there's actually a key element of the dam removal process that I didn't really cover very much on, and that is what can we do during the draw, drawdown period and when the impacts are expected to be significant to juvenile fish to reduce that impact? So there will be crews on the river that will be looking for fish concentrating in key areas around tributary mouths, for example. And the expectation is that those fish will be captured and relocated to cold water refugia, alcoves, off channel habitats, areas where sediment will not be a concern. And through that process, we're gonna lose some fish. So it's actually, a, we analyze the adverse effects of it, but we also analyze the benefits as well. It's also important to note that the numbers I shared with you do not take into account that Fish are smarter than we give them credit for. And fish that are leaving tributaries like the Shasta and the Scott River are likely to hold up in that confluence area where water quality is likely to still be pretty darn good before they enter into the main stem river as well. So we expect avoidance behavior to also play a component of reducing those impacts. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Really appreciate the uh, presentation you just provided. Um, I do have a, a question. It would be uh, regarding slide 18. Um, it uh, involved the uh, publication and key findings. Uh, I'd be the second uh, row. Uh, oops, next slide, Sandra. Sorry about that. Uh, it's the one label Chinook salmon abundance above uh, Iron Gate Dam post dam removal. It'd be a table. It's, yeah, the publications. There's two slides that have uh, excerpts from publications. 
And it would be the second. Keep going up. Keep going up. I believe it's slide 17. There we go, that one. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the second row, uh, Hendrix 2011, um, mm -hmm. the key finding there was median, median escapement and harvest were higher in the dam removal alternative relative to the no action alternative. Um, in, in an earlier slide, you had a graphic on um, fall run um, escapement goal. And so the, the question is, so harvest would be higher, and I presume part of that um, addresses in-river harvest. And, and so if, if that's the case, um, so I, I would be interested in understanding um, what uh, harvest might be under this alternative for uh, tribal fisheries uh, in particular, yeah. represent um, yeah. Pupa and uh, Iraq. And so, um, so what that harvest might look like, I guess, sort of in general matter to maybe what it is today, uh, and what the mix might be with um, hatchery returns and natural returns. Um, yeah. Could you possibly shed some light on that? Um, I know exactly what you're talking about, and so thank you for the question. Um, but I can't recite exactly what Noble Hendricks did in terms of his assumptions on the tribal component of the fishery in this particular model run. This is a publication that was done 10 years ago. And so keep that in mind. Uh, it also was built around, I, I should have mentioned when I shared these, these slides is that each of these publications kind of has its own assumptions built into it, right? Some of them assume full, um, full success associated with the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement that was expired. Some of them have very small, small sideboards associated, others have large. So the Noble Hendricks publication, I can't speak to it, but I do know that there is this harvest component that was built into it. So I guess I would assume that as Noble saw increases in abundance and productivity that it also built in an increase in terms of harvesting for the tribes as well. But I really can't tell you the specifics behind it. However, in the last slide, I share with you the references of all of these present, of all of these publications. So if you like, I could help track this information down in the future, or you can take a look at the publication. Follow up, Joe. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you for that response. Um, I, I guess part of my interest is just really maybe getting even a really coarse um, understanding of what how harvest might change. So, if it's at a certain level today, um, you know, is that harvest expected to, you know, double or? You know what? What? What sort of the, the magnitude of change? I suppose that we sure. might expect with the dams removed. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Further questions, Marcy Remco. You, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, I too want to follow up a little bit on um, Klamath Falls Chinook and plans um, for that species, acknowledging it's the target species in our fishery management plan. Um, I believe on slide 11, um, you're indicating that the objective is to tag 50% of Chinook for fisheries management. Is that a goal or is that the planned expected starting point for tagging? Yeah, thanks for that question. And I'm pleased that I had a meeting with uh, the Iron Gate Hatchery technical team last week so I could help respond to that question of yours. Um, so Department of Fish and Wildlife currently has the funding for, we'll call it one, um, 1.5 million, basically the same amount of tags they currently have today for 6 million fish. 
and I believe the constant fractional marking is 25%. So let's assume it's 1.5 million. They have funding for that to continue into the future. But this tech team that met last week spoke to what are the opportunities to increase that number? There's gonna be a high desire to increase that number here as a result of dam removal and less, less hatchery fish being produced. So I think the next step was for the agencies to go back and look for opportunities for more funding to expand that program. But what we know certainly today is that 1.5 million tags will be available in 2024. Additional questions, Marcy? Yes, thank you. Um, moving to slide 13, um, I believe you um, ran through a series of expected um, percentages of loss for the ESA listed species, or were those all species combined? Those were specifically Chinook. As part okay. of our killer whale analysis, I shared with you the effects to Chinook. Okay, okay. Um, thanks. I saw the title and thought maybe we were only talking ESA species. But okay. Um, if I may, uh, moving to slide 19. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that uh, monitoring plans will be forthcoming shortly, more detailed monitoring plans, I'm assuming. Um, it looks like there's been a number of discussions about long-term monitoring and plans are being made, but maybe you can kind of roll them up for us and help us understand um, if you expect there to be an impact to the core data that is currently being collected that's used to uh, inform our Klamath Fall Run stock assessment. Um, as you know, there's a lot of input data that drives the model, scale age data, cohort information um, to fund, the, uh, you know, run the reconstruction model. So um, perhaps you can elaborate on what you see um, with the plans and in, uh, in, in the works for monitoring and if um, they're going to be adequate to to drive our data heavy model. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, happy to share what I know at this point. Um, what I do know is that the Oregon plan has been released and it does speak to a fairly extensive monitoring plan. Um, whether or not the funding exists to expand their staff resources and tools, I don't know. My understanding is that ODF and W is working towards that today. Um, the California plan has not been released yet, and it'll be out in the spring. My expectation in the California plan is out there, there will be an expansion of the same existing tools that are being used downstream of Iron Gate today to help fisheries management purposes. So what that means is spawning surveys, juvenile surveys, um, rotary screw traps, um, all of that is expected in the California plan. But again, they're in the process of trying to find the funding to expand that program. In terms of what it, dam removal means to the existing monitoring, my expectation is all of the monitoring that currently occurs today will continue into the future. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, thank you. Um, one question about your branch. Um, I know you're the branch chief and I guess, you know, I apologies, I'm not familiar with your staffing levels and the variety of activities that your branch performs, but um, maybe you can share a little bit about whether there are plans for your program to remain stable or increase in terms of funding and personnel. What are, what's the outlook? near term and maybe longer term? Excellent question. And what I could say is that we are not expecting a, a large influx of money as a result of dam removal to the office that I work in, such that we'll be able to expand our staff resources significantly. 
but we are getting more work. There's no question about that. And all of these in infrastructure dollars that are coming to agencies are making for a lot of work in the Section 7 consultation field. And of course, there's just so much we can do with reintroduction and dam removal and looking ahead to the future. Um, but in terms of whether or not our program is going to expand, I don't have that answer, but to date, I'm not, I'm not aware of a large influx of money. Thank you. Further questions? Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Simonday, again, thank you so much for coming today. This was a wonderful presentation. And I, I know you spent a lot of time in the last several days uh, with our various folks um, educating us on this. I did have a couple of questions. You mentioned that for fall Chinook, that um, the um, colonization of the system would be volitional versus um, spring Chinook. I believe there's some sort of trap and haul um, uh, 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 actions in place. Um, can you just give us a sense of uh, whether or not there was a discussion about any sort of trap and haul um, activity for fall Chinook, and uh, perhaps also uh, give us a little bit more information on whether the effects on, say, Sonk Coho stocks would be similar to what you're anticipating for Chinook? Yeah. Happy to answer those, Susan. Um, so the, the monitoring plans will also include evaluations of recolonization, repopulation, and ODF and W's plan to date is that they'll use a window of three generations per species to consider whether or not active reintroduction is necessary in the future. So for coho salmon, that means after nine years. For Chinook, that means 12 years. So for Ch fall Chinook, it'll be a 12 year evaluation of recolonization and production to make a determination down the road as to whether or not a more active seeding of the system is necessary. And then in terms of the impacts to sunk coho salmon associated with dam removal, the impacts we anticipate will be lessened than the numbers I shared with you, primarily because coho salmon are mostly tributary spawners in the Klamath Basin, not to say they don't spawn in the main stem, in fact, this year there were over 50 reds of coho salmon that were observed in the main stem. But that said, we anticipate red suffocation, for example, to be much less for coho salmon than Chinook. And then also the timing of coho smolts moving through the system is a little bit different than juvenile Chinook. And so it's somewhat dependent upon what the hydrology brings us and when the peak flows occur but generally the effects will be less. Yes, go ahead if you have another question. This is just a follow-up to the last point. Um, so would it be fair to think that if the effects were less on Sant Coho um, and there's a lot more um, uh, habitat being open, that the abundances that might result might be uh, maybe even better than what might be projected for Chinook? Well, it would certainly be better for um, the upper Klamath population unit, which is the population that currently has this lost habitat, 76 miles of habitat due to dam, dams being in place. So that will be beneficial for that population for certain. But compare that to 400 miles of habitat for Chinook. Uh, we anticipate that Chinook will receive benefits that are really significant, whereas for coho, I think we'll be less than that. Probably the biggest effects, setting aside those 76 miles of habitat, are associated with the improvements to water quality and the reductions in disease. The, the impacts of disease, Serratonova Shasta in particular, in the Klamath River, have been extreme. As I mentioned in my presentation, we lost over 75% of the hatchery release from Iron Gate Hatchery in 2020. That's just, that's crazy that we're losing that many fish before they even have a chance to make it in the ocean. And we're trying to do our best to address that through release strategies, but until these dams come out next year, it's, it's a hardship on these populations. 
All right, thank you. Chair Gorelnik. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer, and, and thanks for the presentation. As someone who was initially drawn to the council process because of failure back in the mid 2000, 2005, 2006 of the Klamath, it's, it's great to see this work going forward. I have a, question, a few questions, but if you could turn to slide 21, which is towards the end, uh, there's a discussion of Kino Dam and, and other matters. Um, the dam, does that dam sit on the main stem? And if it does, uh, how uh, will passage be accomplished to get to all this new habitat? Yes, the photo on the left is Kino Dam as it currently exists. And note in the fore foreground, the existing ladder. So there is a ladder that currently functions for fish passage today. However, there are issues with it, specifically associated with attraction flows. So there's improvements that need to occur there if we're going to fully see the benefits associated with dam removal. And that's one of the key restoration projects that needs to occur here in the near term. The future of Kino Dam is uncertain. As I mentioned, the ownership is being transferred from Pacific Corps to Bureau of Reclamation. We anticipate that they're going to do an alternatives analysis in the near future to look at opportunities at Kino, which could include removal and reconstruction of another means to affect um, elevation through that reach where there's a number of water diversions upstream. But that said, there's, there's better ways of both meeting the needs of the agricultural community and reducing impacts to fisheries as well. And Kino Dam sits below Upper Klamath Lake. And as you mentioned, there's key habitat upstream of that. Through Upper Klamath Lake are the key tributaries of Williams, Williamson, the Sprague, and the Wood River. And that's the place where we need Chinook to go home to. Yeah, I'm just sort of wondering if, if that is an obstacle to volitional passage and we're not going to and we're going to rely solely on volitional passage for fall run, what's the genuine expectation that there will actually be volitional uh, recolonization of the upper reaches? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a million dollar question, sir. And we don't have the answer today, but there will be a lot of extensive monitoring around this location to see if fish are piling up below it. That's for certain. All right. And I've got a, a question on the hatchery <clears throat> production, the, the new hatchery. I guess I'm a little disappointed to see reduction in production, especially given um, at least the short term uh, uh, decrease in natural production because of sedimentation. And I'm wondering if you considered um, or if someone considered parentage based tagging so that fish could be more fish could be raised and released at a smaller size. This is something that's being done uh, throughout the West, and it would allow the increased production um, of fish at a lower cost and in lieu of, um, you know, the reduced production. So I'd like to find out if that was explored, and if not, why not, and could it be explored? That's a really good question. However, I can't speak for parentage-based tagging, uh, whether or not that was evaluated. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife is the lead on the hatchery. It may be a question better answered by them. Um, we did look at opportunities to maximize production. That was certainly the, the goal, was to maximize production. Uh, with, of course, the prioritization to maintain those same production numbers for coho. Um, some of those fish that are going to be produced, the Chinook that is, may be released early um, because of size, size and capacity constraints. But beyond that, I can't speak to uh, specifically an answer to your question. I would rely on the Department of Fish and Wildlife to help answer that. All right, thanks very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. I've got Vice Chair Penninger and then John North. Yeah, thank you, Jim. This is a fantastic presentation and very enlightening and uh, um, pretty good stuff. Um, 
you talked about the, the reservoir drawdown beginning in January and how long do you think that will take? And um, I'm seeing all the indications that we're probably going to an El Nino this next year, it looks like, and hopefully we'll get some water like we got this year. Um, so I'm kind of curious if, will the drawdown happen soon enough? If it was similar hydrology to this year, would would most of the sediment issues be taken care of next year then, you think? Well, this has been an odd year in the Klamath Basin in terms of hydrology. While we saw snowpack building up early on, we saw inflows into Upper Klamath Lake slow to come this year. And you might be familiar with the Bureau of Reclamation's um, operations this year where we were at minimum flows uh, for most of the year. We saw some pretty healthy tributary accretions that they couldn't hold back at one point, but we're still at minimum flows today. We're waiting for that snow to come off. So this is going to be a late peak flow this year. That's not ideal for the drawdown year. Again, the way the drawdown is going to work is that the tunnels are going to evacuate as much sediment and the flow and the water behind the reservoirs come January 1st. How long that will occur for will be dependent upon what the hydrology is. They're trying to create basically a run of river as quick as possible. So the greatest impacts will occur from January 1st, un first until an un unknown date, which is likely to be sometime in February, which is good because we see a lot less uh, Chinook in the river during that period relative to April, for example. That's important. Um, but it's really hard to speculate what the hydrology is going to be next year. A dry year has the benefits of not impacting peak migration, but it'll extend those impacts into the second year. But when you add those up, it's still less than the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario year is kind of like this year in that we anticipate a lot of water to come in April and early May at a time when density of Chinook in the river is extremely high. So let's hope for a wet year, but let's not hope for a year like this. All right, thank you. John North. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Jim, for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I guess my question relates kind of to slide 12 and also to what um, Brad was touching on, but uh, mostly out of curiosity, I'm just trying to envision the, the basin immediately post channel where it would seem the river would carve through this, you know, bed of fine sediments, but, but also leave substantial sediment on the shoulders. And um, do you, do you picture that that sediment will, will recruit to the river like immediately because of the steep banks and collapsing or I guess what I'm getting at is there what's is there any like habitat work or you know planting or anything planned for that newly exposed habit land yeah there's there's a fairly extensive detailed reservoir restoration plan as part of the project which contains elements like revegetation and active things that can be done to help increase getting that sediment out. You know, there's even talk about um, <coughs> boats circling the reservoir to create wakes and pushing wakes up against the shoreline for it to slough. A lot of that sloughing is gonna occur naturally because again, it's a lot of fine materials but the vegetation is really important to stabilize those banks as soon as possible for certain. As I mentioned, it's a very, it's a messy business. It's been done before on, on other, on other dam removal locations, not quite like this system. This is by far the largest dam removal restoration project we've ever accounted in this country. So there's some unknown certainly, but most of that sediment we anticipate is going to evacuate that first year. That much we do know. Thank you. Right, thank you. Further questions? 
I always have, excuse me, I have to look very carefully because I'm prone to missing hands, but I don't believe I see any. So we appreciate you taking the time to be with us in person today and respond to all those questions. And, uh, and we'll move on then. We'll My pleasure. You Thank you very this. much for your time. Okay. We're going to move into the management team and advisory body reports. There are three. We will take them in the order of the Habitat Committee report, then the Salmon Technical Team, and then the SAS. So to start it off, Dr. Corey Green, I believe you're online to give us the Habitat Committee report. I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the Council. I'm reading agenda item E9B, Supplemental H2 Report 1, Habitat Committee Report on Klamath Dam Removal Update. Jim Simonde, National Marine Fishery Service Klamath Branch Supervisor, provided an update on Klamath River Dam Removal. Here we've, we review some of the key habitat efforts associated with this process. Anticipated short-term habitat impacts are primarily related to sediment movement with the anticipated maximum fish mortality rate of 17% in the immediate vicinity of Iron Gate Dam and a 5% estimated population impact. Smothering of reds in year one is estimated at 13% and is not expected to extend into a second year. Long-term benefits include access to key cold water tributaries upstream for coho salmon, chinook salmon, and steelhead. Chinook salmon will be able to access the Williamson, Sprague, and Wood Rivers, adding 300 plus miles of quality habitat, increased flow variability, restored water temperature patterns, dissolved oxygen increases, increase in wood debris mobilization, increased sediment transport, and reduced blue-green algae will all directly contribute to fish health and migration behavior and will reduce Ceratum exoshasta disease exposure, which currently reaches infection rates as high as 85%. There's a high degree of certainty based on the available science for increased long-term health and abundance of Chinook salmon following dam removal. Kino and Link River dams are not slated for removal as part of this project. Kino Dam has a fish ladder, though it has challenges, especially with regard to attraction flows. There are water quality concerns and a lack of screening in the Kino Reach. The National Marine Fishery Service will reconsult with Bureau of Reclamation in fall 2024 for water operations and potential consideration of Kino Dam removal. A new compliance plan will also be developed. The future of Kino Dam is uncertain as ownership is transferring from Pacific Corps to Bureau of Reclamation. The HD notes that artificial barriers in the Klamath Basin as they relate to essential fish habitat designations will be evaluated during the next EFH review, which is expected to begin in 2024. As noted in California Department of Fish and Wildlife Supplemental Report, dam removal will result in greater uncertainty in assessment of spawner numbers and by extension greater uncertainty in population assessment of fall run Chinook salmon. In situ situations like this, risk assessment approaches that provide additional context of population status can help address increased uncertainty. The HC notes that the habitat indicators developed as part of the Klamath rebuilding plan could serve this function and perhaps be supplemented with additional indicators targeting habitat changes resulting from dam removal. Thank you. Are there questions on the Habitat Committee report? No hands going up here, Dr. Green, so thank you very much. Next move to the Salmon Technical Team report, Dr. O'Farrell, good morning. Morning, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. I'll be referring to agenda item E9B, as Supplemental STT Report 1 on Klamath Dam Removal. The Salmon Technical Team attended a virtual presentation on Klamath Dam Removal given by Jim Seaman Day of NOAA Fisheries West Coast Region. The presentation was very complete, was a very complete summary of the geography of the Klamath Basin, dam removal timeline, impacts and benefits to dam removal of dam removal to Klamath salmon and future planning. Dam removal will potentially affect several aspects of assessment and management of the Klamath River Fall Chinook salmon stock. The current stock assessment includes cohort reconstructions, abundance forecasting, and use of the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model to aid in fishery planning. 
Core data needed for the stock assessment include go to wire tag recoveries, remotion fisheries, freshwater fisheries, and escapement, and age structured escapement and river harvest estimates from scale age data. Iron Gate Hatchery on the Klamath River is slated to close in 2023, and Fall Creek Hatchery will open in 2024. Fall Creek Hatchery will have a lower smolt and yearling production goal post dam removal relative to the current hatchery production, which plans to produce 55% of the current Iron Gate production goal. However, the marking and tagging objective for Fall Creek Hatchery will be 50% of production, while the current marking and tagging objective for Iron Gate Hatchery is 25%. Given the production goals and tagging objectives outlined in the, this presentation, transition from Iron Gate to Fall Creek could result in a small increase in marked and tagged Klamath River Fall Chinook. This is important for the stock assessment as tag recoveries in ocean fisheries are frequently lower than recommended levels in California fisheries. However, the long-term operation of Fall Creek Hatchery is not ensured. Pacific Corps is scheduled to run the hatchery for eight years post dam removal, however, which could lead to elimination of key data currently used for the KRFC uh, stock assessment. With regard to age-specific escapement estimates, the presentation did not directly address changes in escapement sampling and scale collection, though it did provide links to planning documents. The STT supports continued and expanded monitoring of escapement and scale collection to all areas in, in the Klamath, Klamath Basin where Klamath River Falls Chinook return. Are there any questions on the salmon technical team report? Doesn't look like there's any hands, so thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. And finally, the Salmon Advisory Subbasin <laughs> Subpanel Report, Justin Alvarez. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, Vice Chair and Council. Um, my name is Justin Alvarez of the SAS. I'm going to be reading from agenda item E9B, the supplemental SAS report one on the Klamath dam removal update. The Simon Advisory Subpanel was briefed at our April meeting by Jim Simon Day on the Klamath Dam Removal Project. The SAS is encouraged by the progress already made and looks forward to seeing the progress continue and to have the Klamath River return to its full potential. The SAS understands that there will be a period of transition as the river is restored and additional habitat is made available for salmon and other fish and wildlife. The SAS does note that of particular concern are some of the near-term changes, which include immediate loss of salmon, salmon reds, and habitat when sediment is flushed through the system, reduced Chinook hatchery production overall, and the pending loss of funding for Fall Creek hatchery operations in eight years, uh, reduced code wire tagging, code wire tag Chinook, which are used to estimate harvest abundance and fishery impacts, uncertainty in the Klamath Basin recovery could negatively affect harvest opportunities initially. The long-term changes are expected to be beneficial with a decrease in disease rates, increased smelt survival, and adult salmon returns. Are there questions on the Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report? Don't see any hands. Thank you, Justin. That completes our reports and will take us to public comment. We, I know we have one sign up and give us a moment for that to appear on the screen. I believe it is Glenn Spain. All right, Glenn, are you connected? Can you hear us? He's muted. Uh, Glenn, you're muted. And okay, Glenn, if you can hear us, uh, you can go ahead. Um, I see Glenn has raised his hand. Uh, Glenn, you're unmuted on our end. If you can hear us, you can go ahead anytime. Um, 
I'm going to look to Chris. Is that on our end or? Um, tell you what, we've been at it for an hour and 15 minutes. Let's take a very brief break. Let's try and hold it to five minutes and we'll see if we can get Glenn connected. Um, we'll try that again when we come back. So five minutes.
Ah. Okay, can you hear me now on your end? Yes, just hang on for one second, Glenn. We are trying to get everybody back into their seats here. Great, I think I solved the problem on this end. Okay. <laughs> uh, if everybody can please uh, get back to your seats and buckle in. <laughs> All right, now we will commence with public comment, and we have on the line with us Glenn Spain. Go ahead, Glenn. Can you all hear me at this point? Yes. Good. Thank you for your patience. Uh, technology is wonderful, except when it doesn't work. Um, my name is Glenn Spain. I'm the current executive director for the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, and I speak for PCFFA here. I'm also, I have the honor to serve on the board of directors of the Klamath River Renewal Corporation. So I'm one of the people actually managing the dam removal project. And I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. I want to underscore and address one of the concerns that was raised by um, a number of people about sediment. Um, there are uh, lots of myths about sediment, uh, myths that there's a lot of it. There really isn't a lot of highest and the occupation, the occupancy of fish in the lower river is at its lowest. So that's why we have this one year um, rollover and this uh, uh, one to two month window. Uh, we're going to take full advantage of that. The stabilization of all of the uh, available sediment that remains will be rapid. That is a major part of our restoration effort. We have a seed bank of about 17 billion seeds now from native plants. We've been growing them in a, in a plantation for several years now to uh, pull all those seeds together. That is an aggressive part of the restoration effort. So we will do everything we can to minimize the sediment load, but although 1.2 to 2.9 million metric tons sounds scary, in context, this is a river whose um, geological job is to transport sediment. About 6 million metric tons a year would be the normal carrying capacity of the river had the dams not been there. Um, so what we're, we're talking basically not much different than the natural uh, sediment regime for the river to transport that sediment to the ocean except for a very short and well-timed burst that, will minimize, that we uh, will minimize the impact of. Um, in that context, even with the sediment load there, for the vast majority of that time when it's washing out, that will be within the normal range of a wet year. Uh, it shouldn't be a, a serious problem for uh, more than a short period of time, a few days would be the peak of that sediment. Um, the other thing is that in terms of um, control of sediment, we are, you know, there's a myth that you get from watching television. So you get everybody around a blasting unit and you uh, push the plunger and everything blows up and lots of things move around. That does not happen in a, the real world. We are very carefully timing the volume and timing the um, release uh, from the lower river dam, we can time that to the minute simply because we blow the plug um, um, for the system manually. So all of that will be uh, contributing to the minimization of sediment impacts. In addition, stabilizing banks. The uh, pluses of sediment is that the river below Iron Gate Dam is sediment starved and has been for the life of that dam. That means that it's starved of spawning and rearing gravel, starved of the nutrients that normally would be recruited in a river that uh, provide ecosystem protections. And it's also starved of the gravel that's needed to mobilize to minimize C. Shasta uh, parasite infections and the vector infections that are uh, in the moss. So all of that will be net benefit 
uh, those benefits should be um, far reaching. The deficit will be very small and very uh, limited. Uh, and that's the way we're going to be um, uh, handling it. Uh, all of this, by the way, there are a number of other myths that there are toxic uh, sediments and things like that. None of that exists. There are, uh, 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 I've uh, put in the record with my comments uh, some comments that we made on the draft EIR uh, debunking some of these mythologies about what dam removal would mean. And I'd ask that that be put on the record and made available uh, in the record. Um, and if there are any other questions that people have uh, that um, uh, haven't been answered by Jim Simonday's excellent presentation, uh, I'd be well, um, I'd be uh, more than happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Spain? And Glenn, I don't see any hands here. So again, thank you for uh, your testimony. And if you could put my written comments in the record, that would be helpful for people who wanted to verify all these things and look into it in I, more detail. Your written comments are already in the record. So very good. Thank you, thank you much. All right. That completes the public testimony, takes us to our council action which is just council discussion. And so I'm gonna look around the table for some hands here to see who wants to kick this off. Uh, John North. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I'll, you know, although issues like this are generally outside my scope at ODFW, I wanted to provide an update on uh, Oregon's current situation as it relates to the Klamath Dam removals. I, I thought it was most applicable to this agenda item, but as background, the Oregon Fish Department of Fish and Wildlife has been fully engaged in this process for over 20 years and working on agreements and planning and lead, um, that would lead to the removal of the four Klamath dams. And we hope to continue working closely with uh, all the partners and the Klamath River Renewal Corporation uh, as we move forward. Um, however, the funding to monitor repopulation of fall Chinook into the basin and to reintroduce spring Chinook did not make it through our recent uh, budget process. So we currently don't have any allocation or positions dedicated to this work after June of this year. Uh, but if and when funding becomes available, we intend to utilize the 2021 uh, implementation plan and, and guide our reintroduction and monitoring efforts going forward. Uh, that work would include uh, robust monitoring like spawning and carcass surveys, tributary life cycle monitoring stations and juvenile downstream traps. We also have plans for uh, boots, other boots on the ground work to determine if fish are repopulating um, and with an initial focus on false Chinook and to aid in estimating age-specific abundance um, that will help in fishery modeling. We also intend to establish a counting station at Link River Dam and continue our work with California uh, on a sonar system near the Iron Gate site. And we want to continue to work with our partners on a multi that multi-year uh, mark protection study that was initiated last year in the, on Yearling Spring Chinook. So, I just want to provide that update. Um, not the best news, but uh, I just wanted to get it out there. Thank, thank you. Thank you, John. Further discussion? <coughs> Chair Gorelnik. Thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer. Um I guess, I mean, this isn't, uh, it's great information we've received and the, the potential, the future, a potential for future production is great. Uh, I I am a little concerned that about the the lack of uh, well relying solely on volitional um, transport a fall run uh, to all this great habitat when we know there's an obstacle to that. So we're effectively foreclosing all that. I shouldn't say all that, but virtually all of the new habitat to fall Chinook. And so 
I think that's an ODF and W issue. I'm not sure if it's coming from ODFW, if it's coming from another source, but I guess that's one concern I have. And then on the hatchery production, um, especially given the uncertainty about uh, impacts to natural production, and of course the lack of access for the most part to this new habitat for fall run, I'm concerned about the um, reduction in hatchery production of 50%. Um, and I, I, I know that Marcy doesn't have an answer to this, but um, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, it would be useful to understand why uh, the state or whomever uh, is not taking advantage of more modern techniques like parentage-based tagging to increase production because one of the obstacles to raising um, these hatchery fish is they have to get large enough to be tagged. And that requires a lot of room, which I imagine is the constraint on production at the Fall Creek Hatchery. But uh, with parentage-based based tagging, you can release the fish much earlier and much smaller size and, and raise far more. So I guess that's something, maybe it's not part of our council process, but it is, is, it is a inquiry uh, to, to the respective departments. Thank you. Butch Smith. Just a little more to Chairman Grolnick's um, statement there. I, I, this is not my neck of the woods, but I certainly, the poster child or the Washington coast is a poster child for things that haven't gone quite as well as planned in salmon, uh, science. And, uh, um, but I, I was amazed that I, I would have thought uh, the approach would have been better to leave the hatchery production where it was and reduce it as things came back. Um, but to do everything at one time, you have a lot of me moving pieces. So you're really, don't know what's working and what's wrong all uh, you know and so i i wondered that myself and, and uh I, I too you know thought that maybe a better approach would be keep your production at this level and then reduce it as as things come back so i i i too have those concerns um, thank you mr vice chairman further discussion virgil moore just another comment on that in terms of the hatchery production. I, I actually believe the council should have a nexus there. I mean, our desires for sustainable harvest in the ocean uh, relies on some understanding and predictability and, and recruitment. And with the uncertainty that we've got, is eight years enough? And should we also have the production numbers uh, reduced and how does that affect our abilities as a council to plan and execute those sustainable uh, fisheries in the ocean or constrain them because we don't have the fish in the ocean as the case may be. So I don't know how we get at that, but certainly I think our uh, advisory and technical committees could perhaps be of benefit to the discussions as they move forward. Ultimately, the responsibilities for these hatchery is going to rest upon either the states or tribes or some combination thereof long term. And how do we get our heads together from that standpoint to um, take a look at what's going on to validate that production? Uh, I also agree with the chair on his statements about a parental based tagging. It's the way to go. <clears throat> Thank you. Further discussion, Chair Gorelnik? Yeah, I just had a further thought. Um, the, the hatcheries have been paid for by Pacific Corps um, to mitigate for the loss of habitat. And the notion, I guess, is that the habitat will be restored, so therefore they, they, should, be, they should eventually be able to shed that obligation. But there are further constraints and obstacles upstream, the Keno Dam for one, uh, and if that's being transferred to the Bureau of Reclamation, then I think the Bureau of Reclamation should be um, mitigating uh, for the existence of that dam and its um, its impacts 
on, on the fishery. Thank you. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, I didn't want to derail conversation here, but I, I did want to um, echo a little bit of the conversation uh, we had earlier this week about how momentous this is and um, just how largely great it was to get this presentation <laughs> and learn about the history here and how much opportunity um, this is going to provide in the future. Um, and also to just uh, thank Glenn Spain uh, for providing comment today and just recognition of what he's put into this process uh, for the last decades to make this happen. So um, Glenn just wanted to uh, voice my appreciation and say thank you for um, what you've helped make possible. And thank you. Joe Oatman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, you know, again, I, I really appreciated getting uh, this update. Um, information at PowerPoint uh, was really uh, useful. Um, helps me better understand, um, you know, both sort of the timeline and some of the elements that will be involved, you know, as they move forward with removing the dams and, and the restoration that will occur, hatchery production, um, and the expectation that, you know, we'll be um, seeing a, a positive increase in productivity of these fish, and that that will also show up in, um, you know, ocean, freshwater fisheries. Um, I, I would... Um, request that you know as we get further updates on this that we do get some information specific to what the expected um, increase in uh, harvest for both the ocean and freshwater would be pretty helpful um, so we do have to consider um, you know the tribal non-tribal fisheries um, how allocations might um, occur uh, with these higher uh, abundances that we might see. Um, and so having some additional um, information, I think will help us um, as we, again, kind of go through this uh, transition period um, and seeing uh, higher abundances and all of the different um, issues um, and discussions that we'll likely have to have. Thank you, Joe. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> We've been at this for a bit, so I'll try to be brief. I I really do appreciate the, the things we learned this week on this on this topic. I mean, we learned, at least from my perspective, the bookends of of the uh, drain down of the drawdown of the and the sedimentation issues and the red suffocation issues and what the worst case scenario could be. But then reflecting on what uh, some of the comments that Phil Anderson made earlier about the adaptability of these fish and reacclimating to a new a new environment, and the, the that would be afforded by these dams not being there, not not uh, also acknowledging Chair Gorlnick's uh, comments about the the dam that will still be there, but I, I have a better feeling now now that Glenn Spain has also taken the time to kind of give us some reality checks on what's normal flows coming down the river in heavy rain periods and heavy heavy water periods and how it compares to what is going to happen during this drawdown. It makes me think that, you know, it won't be worst case scenario. It might be pretty good. So I would, I would like to have a, since that drawdown will happen very quickly, it'd be nice to get a report on what the actual uh, effect was on the downstream. Of sedimentation and that should be something we should be hearing about so it, it to me I, I feel much better particularly with all that information that you know the presentation we got today and comments earlier in the week and and this that I, I i feel much better about all of this i think i have a better understanding so i appreciate it all thank you thank you 
So as I look around here, maybe I'll summarize. We don't have this notice for any guidance or council action, but we've heard a lot about future updates and uh, bits and pieces about what that would contain. And I think everybody knows day last we get into workload planning and uh, that's an opportunity to look at future schedules and see if you want a similar agenda item there. And uh, I think the staff has heard what that update might contain. And so with that, not seeing any hands, I'm gonna to turn to Robin and see how we've done. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think you've done your work under this agenda item. Uh, very informational for sure. And looking forward to uh, getting more updates as the project uh, continues. So thank you. Uh, Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'd just like to thank Robin and Carrie in particular, who worked really hard um, to help coordinate with Jim and others to bring the presentation to us together or today. All right, thank you. It was a very good presentation and good to have him here in person. So with that, I believe that closes out this agenda item and I will pass the gavel back to our chair. Thank you very much. Well, we will move from salmon to smaller critters. We'll move to coastal pelagic species. We'll give folks a moment to change seats. Some of us have to stay in our seats for every agenda item, but that's not true for everyone. All right, I think we're mostly mostly have our act together here. So Jesse, when you have them when you're ready, please proceed. Good morning, council members. This is agenda item H3, Fishery Management Plan Housekeeping Final Action. So last April, you initiated an administrative or housekeeping amendment for the CPS FMP. And in November, you adopted a draft of proposed changes for public review. Um, that was developed by the CPSMT with an addition recommended by the CPSAS. And none of these proposed changes were intended to change the management of CPS fisheries. So in your briefing book materials, um, attachment one presents that public review draft in an underlined strike through of the CPS FMP, um, which includes the proposed changes related to amendment 20 on management categories um, that was adopted by the council in November. And then attachment two provides a clean version of attachment one. Since the November council meeting, the CPSMT, NIMPS and council staff have reviewed that draft to ensure that all proposed changes were in fact housekeeping. Throughout that review, some proposed changes were found to be unnecessary or beyond a housekeeping action, while other new items were identified for potential change. So attachment three in your briefing book is a new revised version of the public review draft as recommended by the CPSMT. In attachment three, parts that are highlighted in yellow are changes the CPSMT has proposed um, in that they proposed in November 2022, but after further considerations recommends undoing. Parts in green are new changes the CPSMT identified after November 2022 and recommends making. And then attachment four is a clean version of attachment three. 
The CPSMT Report 1 in your advanced briefing book provides a rationale for all of the changes made um, in the public review draft and in the new proposed um, Attachment 3 version, um, including why changes were recommended to be undone or added. The council should consider the recommendations of the CPSMT brought forward in Attachment 3 and the rationale in CPSMT Report 1 and consider adopting revisions to the FMP. Again, adoption of this FMP language would be contingent upon NIMS approval of Amendment 20. So I've gone over um, the materials in your advanced briefing book book, but in addition, the CPSMT um, has a supplemental report too. In addition, there is a supplemental CPSAS report. Your council action today is to adopt final FMP language, and I am happy to answer any questions on the overview or on any of the attachments. All right, thank you very much, Jesse. Let's see if there are any questions on the overview, and if not, we'll proceed with the management team report. Kirk Lynn. Come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Microphone. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, council members. I'll be reading from supplemental CPSMT report two. Uh, management team report on fishery management plan housekeeping and final action. After the advanced briefing book deadline, the CPSMT discussed two changes proposed in the November 2022 draft that the team was still reviewing for accuracy and completeness. During this discussion, the team identified new changes which are described below with rationale and highlighted in blue with the clean version of the section found below. As far as item one, with regards to chapter four, lines 305 to 312 from attachment three in the November public review draft, minor directed fishing was added to clarify that it may be allowed along with live bait when the primary directed fishery for sardine is closed. Upon review after November 2022, the team realized it might be misleading to not also reference the other types of catch that are allowed in the situation including exempted fishing permits and incidental catch. As such, the section header was changed to be more comprehensive. Reference to other types of harvests was added and language changes were made for flow and readability. And so you can see in the report below that both the strike through underline and clean versions of this section. With regards to item number two, uh, this is with uh, regards to chapter four, lines 267 to 269 of attachment three. Um, the November 2022 draft removed a sentence from the transboundary issues section. After review, the team proposes retaining this sentence uh, in that section, which is now lines 153 to 164 with some minor changes to clarify that it is only an example and that other options exist. And similar, you can see the strike through underline and clean versions of this section, along with some uh, preceding background text. And then finally, with regards to future FMP work, ultimately after this in-depth review of the FMP, the team recognizes that parts of the FMP warrant further review, as we had noted previously in our November report, and we recommend that this or these uh, or this review be undertaken under a separate action. And that concludes our report. Be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions on the management team report? Terrific. Thanks very much. Thank you. We have a CPS advisory subpanel report, and Mark Fina is making his way up to the microphone. Welcome, Mark. Good morning. I'm Mark Fina with the CPSAS uh, report on this item. The CPSAS thanks the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team and agency and council staff for their tremendous efforts in developing the proposed revisions to the FMP and the supporting documents to allow stakeholders to track the revisions. 
The proposed revisions will clarify several aspects of the FMP to better allow stakeholders to understand the management of CPS without any substantive changes to the FMP or that process. We support approval of these changes by the council. And that's the report. I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Mark. Are there any questions of the advisory subpanel? All right, you're off the hook. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that completes reports. It takes us to public comment. I think we have one person signed up. Uh, Jeff Shester signed up to be in person. I don't see him in the room. Are you online, Jeff? Oh. <laughs> uh, all right, rounding him up. We'll pause for a moment here. <laughs> All right, Jeff, we didn't really mean to catch you by surprise there, but glad you're here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and my apologies to the members of the council. Didn't re realize you're moving along so quickly. Um, my name is uh, Jeff Shester, representing Oceana. Um, just uh, wanted to um, thank the management team for the, the edits, and we did have some substantive issues that we raised back in November, um, but at least at this time, we don't have any substantive concerns with the amendment. The, the point that we wanted to make was we are we were concerned uh, both in this amendment and the previous CPS FMP amendment um, about this kind of precedent that's being set of a housekeeping amendment that doesn't actually follow the COPs. In particular, um, the this process didn't did not have a three meeting process that included a, a public scoping phase, and the the scope of this was kind of predetermined without, I think, an adequate public input. So in the COPs. It describes a, a three meeting process for amending CPS or all FMPs. And we just hope to make sure that future FMPs do include and actually follow that, um, that process that's laid out in the, in the um, council operating procedures. Um, we also, as we pointed out before, um, believe there was a, a missed opportunity here uh, to include a description of the um, uh, uh, central subpopulation of northern anchovy uh, management regime. Um, right, right now at present, the anchovy harvest control rule is only can actually be found in the council operating procedures. And we believe that um, the, the, the Magnuson Act is pretty clear about the contents of FMPs, that the, the harvest control rules and process for setting specifications actually needs to be in the FMPs. So we wanted to reiterate our request to describe the uh, anchovy harvest control rule in the coastal pelagic species FMP itself. Um, thank you for all your work and for the responsiveness. And um, we look forward to working with you to improve the CPS uh, fishery management plan in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions of Jeff? All right, thank you very much. That uh, concludes our public comment, takes us to our council discussion and action. Um, and this is final action. So I will uh, open the floor for any discussion. And uh, if we don't get any discussion, we'll go in motion. So, Brianna. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to express thanks to the CPSMT for continuing to work on revisions to the FMP housekeeping amendment and to the advisory sub panel and the public for providing comment and to NIMS for reviewing the draft edits as well. And I support adopting the final housekeeping amendment and can offer a motion if you'd like. Well, let's just see if there are any other hands for discussion. And I don't see any, so why don't you, uh, if you have a motion to bring forward, we'll start there. Great. Sandra. Thanks, Sandra. Um, I move that the council adopt the FMP changes as described in agenda item H3, attachment three, with the modifications recommended in supplemental report 
um, supplemental CPSM2 report too. All right, and the language on the screen is accurate and complete? Yes. Look for a second. Seconded by Corey Writings. Please speak to your motion. Um, thank you. I just briefly, um, Jesse outlined that this is um, an FMP amendment where we're just improving clarity and consistency across the sections and making formatting revisions and um, incorporating references to the anchovy framework and, and that none of the proposed changes are intended to change the management of the CPS fisheries. Um, additionally, the CPSMT had provided their rationale in their report explaining each of the revisions. Thanks. All right, thank you. Are there questions for the maker of the motion? Any discussion on the motion? All right, I'm looking real hard. I don't see any hands, so barring that, we'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <clears throat> Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Brianna. Uh, let me see, if, uh, Lynn, Lynn Mattis, please. Um, doesn't have to do with that motion we just passed, but um, in the CPSMT report, they do request that some additional work be happen on the CPS uh, FMP and don't know when that was gonna get scheduled, but wanted to make sure that was still on our radar. Maybe we discuss it under workload planning, but they do recommend some additional work on the FMP be, uh, be conducted. All right, thanks very much, Lynn, for pointing that out. And I'll see if there's any other business for the council under this agenda item and not seeing any hands, I'll turn to Jesse and see how we're doing. Mr. Chair, uh, y'all did fantastic. Um, we will, pending the approval of Amendment 20, we will work on adopting these, uh, getting these changes incorporated to the FMP and post it on the council website. All right, everyone stay in your seats. We're moving straight ahead to agenda item H4 and I'll turn right back to Jesse. Okay, so agenda item H4, this is sardine harvest specifications and management measures for 23-24 final action. So at this meeting, the council will be adopting harvest specifications and management measure for the 23-24 Pacific sardine fishing season. Um, for some context, in April 2022, based on concerns by the stock assessment team, the SSC, and the CPS advisory bodies, um, they recommended postponing the scheduled 2023 benchmark assessment until 2024 until a workshop on stock structure and other uncertainties could be held. You all supported this recommendation and formalized that recommendation in your stock assessment prioritization process in November 2022. At this meeting, the SSC will make a recommendation on the OFL and corresponding ABC to the council based on the 2022 update assessment and other indicators such as recent acoustic trawl survey data. Similar to recent years, the biomass estimates have been below the sardine harvest control rule cutoff of 150,000 metric tons. And aside from small scale and live bait fishing, directed fishing has been prohibited since 2015. The council will also consider incidental landings and fisheries targeting other CPS stocks, non-CPS fisheries, and takes under EFPs, um, which you moved forward yesterday under agenda item H2. For your briefing book, uh, the 2022 update assessment was provided for reference. In addition, there is a supplemental CPS, excuse me, CDFW report, um, which is just providing some information on Pacific sardine landings um, from 2015 to 2023, and that's just for reference. There are two SSC reports, a CPSMT report and a CPSAS report, as well as there was some advanced public comment in the briefing book. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions on the overview. Um, your council action today is to adopt final harvest specifications and management measures for the 23-24 sardine fishery. All right, let's see if there are any questions of Jesse. And if there are not, we will go straight into uh, our reports on this agenda item. And we will start with the SSC report. Uh, Dan Holland, um, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? You bet. Okay. Uh, uh, for the record, uh, I'm Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC, and I'll be reading Agenda Item H4A, Supplemental SSC Report 1 
I'll note that um, John uh, Field is also on the line to uh, help afterwards with answering questions that might go more in depth. <clears throat> the Scientific and Statistical Committee report on sardine harvest specifications and management measures for 2023-2024. Uh, in April 2022, the SSC recommended the 2022 Northern Subpopulation NSP Pacific Sardine Stock Assessment Update be adopted for use by management as a Category 2 assessment. The Category 2 designation was based on a suite of uncertainties, including questions related to the reported large Mexican catch of NSP sardines relative to the estimated total biomass. At that meeting, the stock assessment team expressed concerns about their ability to resolve these uncertainties if also tasked with developing a 2023 stock assessment update. The SSC concurred that delaying a full assessment to 2024 and conducting a review based on, an, on new work to better understand stock structure and other uncertainties would be a productive course for improving stock assessments over the longer term. The SSC discussed the 2022 update stock assessment, their previous statements on an appropriate path forward for 2023 and 24 harvest specifications, and new information related to the summer 2022 acoustic AT biomass estimate of NSP sardine and the outcome of the SSC CPS subcommittee meeting on March 20th through 21st, 2023. The SSC notes that the summer 2022 AT survey estimated a total of a total NSP Pacific sardine biomass of 69,506 tons with a CV of 21%. This represents an increase relative to the 2021 estimate of 40,983 tons with a CV of 37%. Although given this uncertainty, the difference in estimated biomass between the two years is modest. While the SSE recommends adoption of the 2022 survey results for future sardine stock assessments, it does not recommend using the estimate as a direct basis for arriving at an OFL. The SSE notes that the information available during the review discussed under agenda item H1 did not include the proportion of the summer 2022 NSP biomass that is age one plus, as one plus biomass is the quantity used to compute an OFL from the stock assessment. Based on the NIMS report provided under agenda item H1, the SSC recognizes the major, that major improvements to future assessment models are expected. Specifically, the SSC recommends the adoption and use of the Southwest Fisheries Science Center's updated Pacific sardine potential habitat, agenda H1, item H1C supplemental SSC report one, for which the threshold value is based on the assumptions that the high catch of sardine during 2020 and 2021 in Mexican waters was from the southern subpopulation, SSP. This is likely to greatly reduce or remove the apparent conflict between the scale of total estimated NSP biomass and NSP catch in previous assessments, ideally resulting in a more robust assessment. The Southwest Fishery Science Center provided the SSC the latest California Cooperative Ocean, Oceanic Fisheries Investigations, CalCoffee, sea surface temperature values, which were used to inform sardine harvest control rules. The three-year average STT was estimated to be 15.985 degrees Celsius, slightly lower than the 2019 to 2021 average item, uh, temperature of 16.03 nine degrees Celsius reported in 2022 update assessment and used to set the 2022-23 OFL. This would be associated with an EMSY slightly lower than reported in the 2022 update assessment. The SSC noted last year that since this HCR was revised in 2013, the temperature has suggested an EMSY close to the upper end of the recommended range, despite evidence of low productivity and abundance since that time. The SSC recommends that a workshop be convened to revisit the analysis and assumptions that have been used to inform the NSP Pacific Sardine HCR as there continues to be evidence that the adopted relationship between sardine product productivity and ocean temperature is not currently valid. The SSC recommends rolling over the 2022-23 OFL of 5506 tons, 5506 tons for the 2023-2024 management cycle, given a lack of compelling evidence that NSP biomass has changed substantially between 2021 and 2022, and the lack of complete information needed to apply the full OFL formula to an updated biomass estimate. Rolling over the 2022-2023 OFL was identified by the SSC in November 2020 in its November 2022 SSC statement on stock assessment prioritization as a potential course of action in the absence of an update stock assessment or other substantial information. The SSC recommends that the Category 2 Sigma continue to be used 
to inform the ABC when combined with the Council's decision for a P-STAR, since the revised catch estimates based on the new habitat model have not been evaluated with, within the assessment and retrospective issues continue to be a concern in the 2022 update assessment. The sigma value should be multiplied by 1.31 to account for the time that has passed since the update assessment was conducted. Table one below provides the recommended OFL and ABC values for PSTAR alternatives that may be selected by the council. Finally, the SSC notes that the information reviewed by the SSC CPS subcommittee indicated that the abundance of NSP in Mexican waters appears to have declined over time, suggesting that the distribution term used to apportion the OFL for the NSP should be reconsidered. Similarly, an increasing proportion of the U.S. sardine catch, particularly in Southern California waters, has been assigned to the SPP based on, new, on the new habitat model. The SPP is SSP is not currently included in the CPS FMP. Consequently, catches of SSP are counted against allowable catch for NSP. The SSC recommends that the council consider an appropriate means of identifying management approaches for the SSP, given its inferred increased presence in the U.S. waters. Um, I won't read everything in table one, but I'll note that the, again, it has the OFL at 5506 tons, uh, and uh, it gives a set of buffers and ABCs for P stars running from 0.45 down to 0.25. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I'll note again that, that John Field is also with me to, to help with questions that I may not be able to answer. Things in line with previous statements by the SSC, but um, I was hoping perhaps you or Dr. Field could speak to some of the other discussion that occurred, at least as I recall it, during the SSC discussion on this topic, um, just about the sort of relative value of that EMSY at the moment and its continued use um, as per your recommendation in uh, setting the OFL and ABC this year, if that makes sense, or if I'm not misrecalling the discussion that occurred. Thank you. Uh uh, through the chair, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Lindsay. Um, I uh, will do my best here, uh, and and if if I'm not getting to your your question, then we can ask um, John maybe to to um, add to it. But um, I think you know our discussion is that that clearly the the EMSY should be re revisited, and the temperature the use of the temperature in the HGSR should be revisited um, uh, because it it. You know, it has been at this high, hot, this high level, um, despite the fact that we seem to have, be seeing lower, lower biomass. Um, I don't think that we're suggesting at this point um, that it should be abandoned um, uh, until, you know, in, until uh, that uh, future work has been done and workshop has been held. Further questions? Yeah, I. I don't see a follow-up, so I think we're good there. Was there further comment from the SSC? Uh, no. That... All right, Corey Niles. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dan. Um, on on that topic, I guess maybe I might have a question on another topic here too. But I guess on this, on this, um, eventually at some point, having a uh, a, a relook at the temperature relationship in EMSY, and everyone seems to agree that it's the relationship is broken down, and, and the OFL is too high, um, likely too high. Yeah, I think um, in my mind that involves some kind of workshop of where you you look at other relationships, other variables. But is there? I think there has also been discussion in the past about how, especially when the SSC was reviewing an assessment. Um, and when it comes to the 2024 assessment, that if you think it's it's way off, I think you and I'm going to get this wrong, but you can do things by look looking looking at the um, recent productivity, and look at, at recent recruitment. And I'm just going to can you um, you know absent that workshop, what are the SSC's um, flex, what is the SSC's flexibility? To where if that if that if that looks like it's really long do you wrong do you have discretion to um, do things like look at the recent productivity and, and use that instead and that was maybe a confusing way of asking the question but um, I'll stop there to see if see if it's uh, comprehensible. 
Okay, uh, through the chair, a question for, uh, thank, thank you for the question, Mr. Niles. Um, you know, I'm not uh, sure I have a good answer for you. I, I mean, we can, um, you know, we, we, you, we could um, call it, you know, a category three assessment, but, you know, that would basically just lead to a, a larger um, buffer. And, you know, that was discussed, but was um, uh, ultimately rejected uh, in favor of a category two. Um, I'm not sure what the other options are really, um, other than rolling over um, the OFL, but um, John Field is on the line here. And um, so I think, uh, and it, so if, if you want to unmute John, maybe you've got, maybe you can add something to that. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, council. Can folks hear me? Yep, loud and clear, John, welcome. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for the question, Corey. I'll, I'll try to expand a little bit. I, I guess I will confess that procedure-wise, I'm not entirely sure how that might work. But one thing that was discussed is that um, our recollection is that the EMSY was estimated to be about 0.18 when the effects of temperature and productivity were ignored from that original workshop. All of that happened before I joined the SSC. So this is based on the you know, discussion that we had at this last meeting about this topic. So one discussion we had was that this value of 0.18 could be an alternative value to use in the future pending some sort of reanalysis of the harvest control rule. Um, it was also, we also discussed that the productivity function that was used to inform the harvest control rule was based on recruits per spawner, not absolute recruitment. So we did, you know, that we would want to do a proper analysis that, you know, there's evidence for this decline in productivity, but I think the SSC was hesitant to throw it out uh, the window quite yet without taking that proper look. So it would be possible that uh, we could take a closer look at a workshop would be ideal. I don't know how much of a closer look we could take as part of a future assessment. And I don't, I'll, I'll confess, I would defer to council staff as to whether the SSC had the ability to make that recommendation in the absence of a workshop or, or, or not. I don't know how the 0.18 would come into play, but I know that was something that was discussed as a potential option for the future. I hope that somewhat answers the question. <laughs> Corey? Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, and I guess um, I don't know. We need to put council staff on the on the on the hot seat here for the procedure of. Um, but it it also I guess the other way of asking it was um, people have in mind that this workshop would be, you know, searching for another environmental correlate that that helps us with recruitment, but. Um, I think in the past it's been the workshop might be more narrowly focused on abandoning any kind of environmental variable and just using um, more different information on, on the observations on recruitment um, more narrowly. And it sounds like you were that was what you all discussed, but it would take a workshop to even do that, assuming, you know, putting aside the, the flexibility the SSC has now. but. So yeah, I, I think you answered it, John. That there is possibly a, it's not just a searching for new environmental variables necessarily. It, it could be looking at um, harvest rates that don't don't have those correlates attached to them. But if I got that wrong, please correct me. Thank you, Mr. Niles. No, I I, I think that's a, a reasonable interpretation. Further questions of the SSC. Corey Niles. Yeah, one more question here on the, um, I've lost count of the paragraphs, but on the one that, in, that discusses distribution. Um, so I think there are, there are a couple aspects. Distribution is meant to represent um, the, the proportion of the northern substock that's in US waters. We're seeing a situation where we think it actually it's the, the southern um, Substock or subpopulation is coming even more north. Um, and my, so my question is on that last couple of sentences where you say, or um, catches of the southern subpopulation are counted against the allowable catch of the northern subpopulation, and then that you recommend we consider ways of um, 
dealing with that is <laughs> paraphrasing, but did you have, do you have any more elaboration on how we should deal with that with, or, or when? Uh, um, yeah, to the chair, um, thank you for the question, Mr. Niles. Um, I, it, that seems to be a little, uh, something that would be a little bit out of our, um, the SSC's purview. I mean, it's a, it seems like it's a management question, a policy question um, about how you would um, start implementing management um, uh, to, that, uh, to that stock. Um, uh, I think we're suggesting that um, there seems to be some clear evidence that there is uh, the you know there is presence of the of the SSP and uh, in the U.S. waters and the catch, um, and that uh, also there's uh, evidence um, to suggest that that will increase over time as the stock shifts up, and so uh, it would be good to develop a management approach, a management plan to to deal with that. But um, I think. Doing that is is not really something that the SSC uh, would do. It'd be something we might re review. All right. Further questions of the SSC. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have two further reports. Um, we'll first hear from the CPS management team. Greg Kritzikowski. Thank you, Chair Grolnick uh, and members of the council. I will be reading from the uh, agenda item H4A, Supplemental CPS uh, Report 1. Uh, the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team reviewed the 2022 uh, Pacific Sardine Update Assessment and newly available scientific information for the northern subpopulation of Pacific Sardine considered by the SSC for recommending an overfishing limit and corresponding acceptable biological catch values for 2023-2024 harvest specifications. The new information included results from the summer 2021 <laughs> and draft results from the summer 2022 uh, Fishery Science Center Acoustic Trawl Survey. Additional new information considered by the SSC included uh, outcomes of the sardine stock structure workshop and updated information on the Cal Coffee temperature index utilized to determine the ESY, EMSY for this stock. The CPSMT also reviewed the SSC report with its recommendations for harvest specifications. The SSC recommended an OFL uh, for the 2023-24 fishing season based on the 2022 update assessment. The H1 plus biomass used in 2022 to calculate the OFL was 27,369 metric tons. The summer survey, uh, summer 2022 survey draft estimate for total biomass of the northern uh, stock of Pacific sardine was 69,506 metric tons. The stock likely remains below the cutoff value of 150,000 metric tons of age one plus biomass. And therefore, the CPS uh, fishery management team or this fishery management plan dictates that the primary directed fishery be closed for the 2023-2024 season. This does not prohibit allowing exempted fishing permits, incidental catch, minor directed catch, or catch from live bait, recreational, and tribal fisheries. Table one below presents the OFL and the range of ABC values based on various P star values provided by the SSC. The CPS MT recommends a P star value of 0.4 for use in setting harvest specifications, which produces an ABC of 3,953 metric tons. 
for the 2023-2024 fishing year, setting an annual catch limit, ACL, uh, equal to the ABC, and an annual catch target of 33,600 metric tons for the uh, upcoming fishing year, and that's in Table 2. This will, res uh, this will afford opportunity to CPS fisheries and accommodate the proposed EFP request, requesting a total of 670, uh, 100, 670 metric tons. Um, while avoiding restricting non-CPS fisheries that may incidentally harvest sardine, since achieving the ACL could result in prohibition of take in all fisheries. The CPSMT recommends the accountability measures listed below to prevent um, exceeding the ACL. Uh, the Let's see. Uh, the CPSMT notes that all sources of catch, including any EFP set aside, slide bait fishery, and other minimal sources of harvest, such as incidental catches in CPS and non CPS fisheries and minor directed fishing, will be accounted for against the ACL. These recommended harvest specifications align with the recently adopted rebuilding plan for Pacific sardine. Table three below summarizes the level of sardine catch in uh, CPS and non-CPS fisheries for the most recent fishing seasons and shows that recent catch in US uh, has remained below the ACL. Future research and management and assessment recommendations. The CPSMT maintains its position that there is a need for research to address gaps in information that could improve management of the Pacific sardine stock. And we reference our previous uh, report there. Following the stock structure workshop, the CPSMT recommends reevaluating EMSY as a near term priority uh, to help resolve uncertainties associated with the productivity of this stock. The CPSMT notes that this stock has been largely present in waters north of Cape Mendocino since 2014, when the Cal Coffee temperature index was first applied, and that the resulting EMSY is based on temperatures in waters that the stock is not even utilizing. The CPSMT recognizes substantial regional differences among northern, central, and southern portions of the California current ecosystem, as noted in the 2022-2023 uh, status report, and reference the uh, status report from March there. The CPSMT also suggests consideration, consideration of methods to determine if EMSY would benefit from a mechanistic understanding of stock productivity uh, given that correlation relationships used for fishery management purposes, like sea surface temperature for sardine, tend to break down as new data are added over time. The SSC identified issues with distribution term as well, noting that much of the catch in California is attributed to the southern stock of Pacific sardine. This can be seen by comparing Table 3 in our report uh, to Table 5 in the 2022 Sardine Update Assessment, and there's a reference there, even before the habitat model was updated. Uh, given the new archetype being utilized as part of the operational definition for the northern and southern stocks of Pacific Sardine, uh, the CPSMT agrees with the SSC that EMSY be re-examined and recommends that the SSC CPS subcommittee conduct a workshop after the 2024 Pacific Sardine assessment to revisit all the analyses and assumptions that have been used to inform the Pacific Sardine harvest control rule. And there are tables there, table 
Uh, one provide that's a, again just a summary um, with the from the SSC reproduced there. The OFL is 5,506 metric tons. Uh, the table two provides um, again the OFL are recommended the CPSMT's recommended uh, P star buffer of 0.4. The uh, resulting ABC of 3,953 metric tons, our recommendation for the ACL being set the same, and an ACT of 3,600 metric tons. The list of accountability measures uh, specifically include uh, incidental landing limit in CPS fisheries for Pacific sardine of 20%. Um, if landings in the live bait uh, fishery attain 2,500 metric tons, a uh, per landing limit of one metric ton of Pacific uh, sardine per trip would apply to that fishery. Uh, if the ACT of 33,600 metric tons is attained, a per trip limit of one metric ton Pacific sardine applies to all CPS fisheries. And the fourth one is an incidental uh, per landing allowance of two metric tons of Pacific sardine in non-CPS fisheries until the ACL is reached. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for the management team report. I'll look around the table to see if there are any hands. Uh, Corey Niles, followed by Karen Braby. To be fair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Ms. Braby had, Dr. Braby had me beat by a good 30 seconds, so I would defer. To her. Uh, all right, Dr. Braby. Right. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks, uh, Greg, for the report. I was hoping that you could go into a little more detail on the last sentence in the narrative of the report which talks about the EMSY workshop, the workshop to evaluate further temperature uh, productivity relationships or other productivity relationships. Not in whether to have the workshop, but in the timing of when that workshop would come to bear and how that would fit into the assessments and just wanted to understand a little bit more about the detail on the timing of it and the rationale for that timing um, from the team's perspective. Yeah, we have heard um, with discussions with um, you know, scientists and assessors and many of the people that would need to be at that workshop are also, you know, involved with the assessment science um, and the uh, trawl surveys and that sort of stuff. And our, our thoughts on the timing, the team's thoughts on the timing were that it would be best if it were scheduled for after the assessment is done to allow people to focus on that um, and you know hopefully get results before you know the uh, um, following assessment. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, it does. Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And that was one of my questions. This, this the second one, uh, Greg, is one I just I asked the SSC, and it pro was probably more appropriate for you all on on this matter of distribution and in the southern stock um, and the catches being deducted, among other things, the catches being deducted off the northern, as if they're coming from the northern stock. Um, it's, it's and uh, the team has been telling us for years that we should. Um, fix this and it was maybe the habitat model and ability inability to do that was holding us up but what is do you have elaborations along the lines of EMSY on how we how we take this distribution and, and southern stock and the catch accounting part um, into account there's a lot in there Corey I mean you mentioned EMSY as one thing but distribution as another and management for southern stock so I I'm I'll try to separate those out, or if you want to uh, clarify first. Corey? Yeah, apologies about that, Greg. The, ignore EMSY for now. Karin got my question. So it also, on the one question on, on what is your plan here for similarly on the timeline of how we would deal with distribution? Yeah, um, so you are absolutely correct that for some time now, there has been a little bit of a mismatch in in terms of management in 
all of the catch being assigned or or attributed to um, uh, the northern stock for management purposes. And yet when the assessments come out, they are using the habitat model to, uh, you know, uh, assign some of the catch, particularly in Southern California, where most of the catch is occurring right now through the live bait fishery um, to the Southern stock. The team discussed, you know, how to move forward and what to do with the management side of things. And the consensus was that at this time with so many things up in the air uh, and waiting for, you know, an outcome from a, a workshop. I mean, we did get some new information from the habitat model, you know, about the um, reassignment, but it wasn't necessarily the right time to directly take on the management aspects of that. Um, I, and I don't want to speak for, you know, there were things mentioned at the distribution workshop in terms of, you know, capabilities that, uh, you know, of applying that habitat model um, after the fact. But I don't want to speak for the scientists down there and, and what was said there as their ability to, you know, do that and assign stocks in a closer to real time manner. Further questions on the management team report? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Mark Fina is familiar with the drill. He knows he's up next. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Mark Fina for the CPSAS. Good morning again. I'm here with the CPSAS uh, report on sardine harvest specs and management measures. The CPSAS received a report on sardine harvest specs and management measures. We support the SSC's recommendations for the overfishing limit of 5,506 metric tons and maintaining category two sigma. Survey results show a 37% increase in the estimated population of the northern subpopulation from last year to 69,506 metric tons. Fishermen have observed increasing and substantial numbers of sardines, particularly in Southern California, where catches are more prevalent in the bait fishery. In addition, the revised habitat model suggests a substantial portion of the catches, including bycatch in Southern California, are from the Southern subpopulation. We support the CPSMT's recommendations of a P star buffer of 0.4, an ABC and ACL of 3,953 metric tons, an ACT of 3,600 metric tons. We also support the CPSMT's recommended accountability measures. These are incidental landing limit of in CPS fisheries of 20%. A second provision is if landings in the live bait fishery attain 2,500 metric tons, a per landing limit of one metric ton of sardine would be applied to the live bait fishery. A third measure is if the ACT of 3,600 metric tons is attained, a per trip limit of one metric ton of sardine would apply to all CPS fisheries. And fourthly, an incidental per land, an incidental per landing allowance of two metric tons of sardine in non-CPS fisheries until the ACL is reached. Uh, in the next paragraph, there's a, an error, so I want to point that out first. If you look at the numbers, uh, we say that we believe the it should be 60, 670 metric tons of proposed to be allocated to the two F EFPs. And then the second EFP is 520 tons as opposed to 570 as it shows in this written report. So we believe that this the 670 metric tons proposed to be allocated to the two EFPs, 150 metric tons to the point set EFP and 520 tons to the biological sampling EFP will leave sufficient sardines Pacific sardine for both the live bait fishery and the bycatch fishery, the bycatch and other fisheries. 
and recommend the council approve these amounts. We further support the SSC's recommendations for one, a workshop for revising the EMSY. The CPSAS recommends that this occur prior to the next specification cycle, if possible. Uh, NIMS scientists uh, revisiting the distribution term, which is currently 87% of the northern subpopulation in light of the revisions to the habitat model. And then we also say that uh, with while recognizing the shortcoming of the current management of sardines, including the lack of management of the southern subpopulation, we believe that management revision should wait until completion of a more of more of the ongoing sardine research concerning the sardine population and its distribution, as that research will provide for better management of the sardine population as a whole. Devel developing, developing management now is likely to result in some waste of resources and, and duplication of effort. And then we also suggest that you see our report on the NIMFS report um, for a little more discussion of that issue. All right, thank you very much. Questions of the AS? All right, thank you very much. Thanks. That concludes our reports and takes us to public comment. The last I looked, we had three folks signed up for public comment. And we'll get that list up. So we will start with Matt Everingham, who is remote. So Matt, you're unmuted on our side. So uh, please proceed when you're ready. Good morning. Can you hear me? We're not hearing you, Matt. Okay, how about now? All right, you're, you're with us now, I think. Excellent. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start. <clears throat> Please. Hello, my name is Matt Everingham. I speak to you today from Everingham Brothers Bait Company. We're based in San Diego, and we have been providing live bait here since 1951. I'm a fourth generation commercial fisherman. As I have testified many times before, uh, we are continuing to see an unusually consistent abundance of sardines here in Southern California. We're seeing large schools of sardines literally every time we go fishing. This year, year round abundance, and again, that's part of what's unusual about it is that it has been year round for the past six years or so, continues to be highly unusual in decades past. This is something that we're hoping to understand better. <clears throat> One additional uh, thing to consider uh, in the CDFW report of live bait landings, that uh, it needs to be considered that the value of live bait as a fishery to our community cannot be determined from X vessel value alone. The landings report shows an average value of a few million per year, if I'm reading it correctly when the economic impact attributed to live bait in our community has been estimated to be in the billions of dollars because of all the tourism sector and other activity it enables, both on and off the water. This is a lot of economic value generated for fish that are essentially borrowed from the ocean and subsequently returned. If we were to lose access to sardines for live bait, we would be unable to meet the needs of our community by fishing for other CPS species this would have a major impact in the negative to our community. Our customers and our community depend on access to live bait. In order to be sustainable as a business and to accomplish good stewardship, we need to focus on our daily effort. We need to focus our daily effort on the live bait that is abundant in our waters. Again, most of the live bait that we catch is returned to the ecosystem and we like to consider that the impact is not the same as other fisheries. Also, we are still trying to under understand why this unusually consistent year-round abundance has persisted in our Southern California waters. And I have to pose the question if it's uh, to do with, you know, possibly we're fishing, you know, both Northern and Southern subpopulation sardines. And one thing that caught my attention was figure one from the stock structure workshop, which shows the areas of influence for 
the subpopulations, it appears that San Diego is kind of in the middle where it would appear that we have access to both. So uh, I support the, the comments that Mark Fina has made in that regard and also um, ask that you do not reduce the uh, catch allowable for live bait. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Matt. Are there questions of Matt? Thank you, Matt. We'll now hear from Jeff Shester. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, again, good morning. My name is Jeff Shester, representing Oceana. Um, we wanted to um, just start by reiterating our continued concern that the, the northern subpopulation of Pacific sardine remains overfished. And as, as we've stated in the past, we, we have been concerned that the rebuilding plan is, is not sufficient to rebuild on the uh, on adequate timelines. Um, there has really been no clear sign of a major recruitment event um, so far as the stock remains low. And just some in terms of how wh wh where we're guided in terms of this, uh, in terms of our position, um, all of the management strategy evaluations that have been done on Pacific Sardine do show that even low levels of fishing when the stock is low and it's, it's current low condition can uh, delay rebuilding. Um, and so uh, we, we do believe that we're not in a situation that the levels of take are not having an impact on the stock and it's just all environment. We believe that the, the models and the data do show that when even the levels of catch that we're talking about, even the matter of a couple hundred tons may not seem like a lot, but in terms of the compound interest that, that happens when you're looking at rebuilding, it, make, it can make a big difference in terms of delaying rebuilding. Um, so we, we do support the management team's um, uh, recommendation that the directed fishery remain closed. Uh, and wanted to just, again, re reiterate our concern over the EMSY, overestimating productivity. Right now, it's currently being set at over 20% level. We believe this is about four to five times too high. Um, the, the CPS FMP originally um, set a 5% EMSY uh, fishing rate four times when the stock was low. And that was the idea is that, that when the stock is high productivity, it would go up to 15 and low productivity would be five. We we're clearly in the low productivity scenario. And we believe that there is some rationale to use that 5% in, you know, in the absence of, uh, of, of other information. What that would mean in terms of this year and the overfishing limit, uh, the overfishing limit with a 5% EMSY would be 1,190 metric tons. Um, and, and given the need for uh, precaution or those concerns over the EMSY and the need to rebuild, we urge the council to select a P-star of no greater than 0 0.30. So um, that's, that would be a lowering of the P-star. And so we request, and this is in our letter as well, uh, that the ACT be set no greater than 800 metric tons this year and allow for only 10% uh, incidental catch of sardines and other fisheries. We do believe this would allow incidental catch, EFPs, and live bait fishery while putting reasonable limits uh, and constraining each of those sectors to, to allow rebuilding, but that this does would be, a, a, I think, a, an adequate balance that would balance fishing opportunities with the need for timely rebuilding. Um, so I wanted to just kind of spend the rest of my testimony focusing on the, uh, this idea of a EMSY workshop uh, to in inform future uh, specifications. We'd like to see the council include in its motion uh, un under this item today, a request to its SSC subcommittee to work with the Southwest Fisheries Science Center to conduct a workshop in 2023 to evaluate and create options for an updated EMSY parameter uh, in the harvest control rule for the northern subpopulation of sardine based on the latest understanding of stock structure and recent productivity so that this could actually inform the next round of specifications uh, for 2024 and 25. Um, we note that the OFL remains 
highly sensitive to the EMSY and uh, in all three of your advisory body statements from the SSC, the advisory subpanel and the management team, um, there is rationale and support for conducting this workshop. Um, clearly the Cal Coffee data has been shown not to be an accurate or valid predictor of, uh, of sardine productivity. The Cal Coffee survey isn't even happening now where most of the Northern subpopulation is and where spawning is occurring for the Northern subpopulation. And this has now been expressed as not a long-term but a near-term priority by your management teams and by the SSC. Um, we, we, we understand that in terms of the pause that was taken this last year to work on stock structure, that the sequence was that first, let's figure out the stock structure question, come up with our best working hypothesis of that. And then once we have that, then let's look at the EMSY uh, based on our current understanding of stock structure. So that is where we believe we are in the sequence that this is, it's time for this. Um, I think that uh, uh, as, as a, uh, Mr. Lindsay pointed out with the, the W word of, of workload that that's probably the kind of key consideration that I think is is really kind of potentially um, uh, uh, limiting this. And we, we believe that that can be uh, very readily addressed by limiting the scope of that workshop to focusing on standard methods that are already out there to directly calculate recent productivity from stock assessments. And I did want to point out that this is not something that requires like a whole new method to be developed. Specifically, this EMSY was done in a matter of just, you know, a, a couple weeks at the end of the anchovy assessment in 2022, where the assessment authors realized the council needs a new EMSY and were able to then use the assessment itself to calculate an updated EMSY, which was put in an appendix and the council was able to adopt. Now, my, my point being is we're not suggesting you just do that and adopt that without thinking about it, but that this is not necessarily reinventing the wheel. There are methods that are out there that, that follow the, the Science Center's recommendations for looking at recent productivity to develop an EMSY. Um, we also just, we don't believe that a static long-term EMSY makes sense. We do believe that we should maintain this idea that the productivity of sardines does have extended periods of lows and highs and the EMSY should vary based on that. We're just concerned that we don't want that to be based on the wrong predictor. Um, so the best prediction that is out there is what has the stock been doing recently? Looking at recent recruitment, stock assessments are able to do that and there are readily available methods to do EMSYs. So keeping this, you know, the SSC did describe in its discussion that this could be straightforward. There's a strong need for this, but they need a request from the council in order to do that work. It's not something that they're just going to kind of do on their own or volunteer without a council request. So we don't believe we're talking about a huge workshop that's going to look at every single environmental parameter and have all different folks come in with developing a whole bunch of new methods. This can be done, I think, with a reasonable amount of workload. It's got support around the table uh, from scientists and stakeholders. And it's important to ensure, given I think that, that there's a, around the table recognition of the problem, that the specifications are based on the best available science to prevent overfishing and rebuild the stock in a timely manner. Um, so lastly, uh, just also wanted to reiterate the need for addressing the Southern stock in the CPS FMP as per uh, my comments yesterday and hope to the council can find a way forward to start considering the best way to do that and looking at options uh, to address concerns like you heard from the previous speaker. Um, thank you again and uh, happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Jeff. Let's see if there are any questions from around the table. All right, uh, Corey Niles. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, and I've had the benefit of um, having some other conversations with you over time and just maybe to better understand your suggestion on, on uh, EMSY, which I think a lot of people, it's, it's somewhat ironic, might not be the right word, but you're as a longtime proponent of, of ecosystem-based uh, management and looking for ways to improve our, our assessments with environmental factors. You're now saying that this one just doesn't work and it look, so you're not, you're not saying go look for a new relationship so much, but look at the best available science and, um, and, and get a more, uh, you think a more realistic in your mind estimate of what productivity is rather than assuming that this temperature 
thing is still going on. So I guess the way I'll ask you to maybe respond is, I don't know if you heard what I asked the SSC, but I know you've been doing this for a number of years. And what is your understanding, like if you, uh, um, the SSC, are we limited by the FMP in terms of what the SSC is able to do now in order to look at the, the um, types of thing you are asking for, which you, you, you're probably, I'm hearing you say, yes, they are, they have told you they're limited in what they can do. You need the CPS subcommittee to take a look at doing something differently. Um, but they can't do, for example, just look at the stock recruitment curve, absent temperature, and come up with something different now is what you're saying. I'm going to stop there and just see if you can um, elaborate, focus a little bit more on, on on what you think is they're able to do and what you would like them to do differently. Um, thank you through to the chair. Um, Mr. Niles, thank you very much uh, for the question. I'll, I'll try not to uh, pontificate too, too far on this, but... Um, I think in terms of your question about the the irony of not using you know environmental uh, predictors anymore um I, I i i think what we would want to see is if you do have a a an environmental predictor that does seem to be very consistent and accurate over time we do believe that's that makes a lot of sense i think the difference is in this case if you're using a predictor that is actually telling you the wrong thing we don't want to support that just because it's an environmental predictor and that's ecosystem based management. So in other words, you know, false ecosystem based management is is not what we what we support. So what we've been looking at here is listening to to the questions and the various analysis that's looked at this. What we have found and concluded in terms of the science is that the best predictor of the current productivity of sardine is actually the recent productivity of sardine, which you can actually see in a single species basis, rather than, and that, that is a better predictor than other environmental variables. And so our idea is, you know, it's not that we like single species or environment better, let's figure out which of those is the best predictor. And so right now that seems to be the clearest indication that is the most consistent. And 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 we believe again, the methods to do, to, to look at productivity from uh, you know, of, of you know in recent years and create an EMSY that's not reinventing the wheel that there are standard methods in fishery science to do that the main question is how many years back do you go right in the remember in the rebuilding plan there was a big difference in productivity by going back 10 years versus 15 and do you have you know years of so so how how long do you want to look backwards and that's going to be sort of the the key question um answering your question about what role or realm does the FMP give the SSC to change the the formula? Um, I I was there back in the the last um, round when the SSC adopted the Cal Coffee Index, and the FMP is very clear that the the SSC has full authority to and the council as well, based on adopting the SSC recommendations to change the EMSY formula based on best available science. That does not have to go through an FMP amendment of the, that is within the scope of the SSC's authority and ability. They could do that now, they just haven't been asked to, and that's exactly how it was done before. The SSC gave you a statement, I think it was 2013, hey, we wanna update the index and how we're calculating EMSY, here's the new approach. It was adopted by the council and that was you know how things went forward in the specs so we believe that the the ssc um, does fully have the ability to do this if the council requests it further questions all right thanks very much jeff thank you very much all right mark fina well, you're here for public comment. I'm going to pass for public. Comment. You're going to pass. All right. Well, then that concludes public comment. Um, and takes us to our council action here, in which uh, Sandra will bring up. And that's our council action to adopt an OFL and the other parameters. Um, and so we'll start with some discussion and then we will have a motion and further discussion upon that. So let me just first see if there's any general discussion on this agenda item. Karen Braby. There was ESP, I barely. Pardon me. 
<laughs> I didn't even raise my hand, but I was thinking no, about you're, it. Yeah, so I know. That's Brianna, great. <laughs> Brianna, Brianna Brady. Okay. <laughs> It's okay with me if Karen wants to. No, Brianna, go. Okay. Um, thank you. I just wanted to express my appreciation to the SSC for providing a recommendation for the best available OFL and, and ABC, and to also thank um, the advisory bodies and the public for the discussion regarding the sardine management. I am supportive of the MTs and the AS's recommendations for the specifications and the management measures, um, including the amount specified for the EFPs. So, um, 520 metric tons and 150 metric tons. So those are just some initial thoughts. Thank you. Further, Karen Braby, Dr. Braby. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to wax a little more uh, philosophical, I guess. Um, and I wanted to just start with a statement that you know we're not in the ideal situation, right? We're in, in a situation where the assessment is in, you know, applying staleness factors. We, we have a lot of anecdotes about where uh, sardine are and, and how to deal with them. We've had this great workshop, but there are some questions about um, uh, the two stock hypothesis and how to apply that. Um, we have clear need for uh, better understanding productivity correlates. Uh, right now we're using temperature productivity correlates that, that don't seem to be working uh, very well. And um, we're in a situation where we've been in uh, a very small scale uh, non-directed fishery harvest regime for some time. Um, and that um, and that gives me confidence uh, to think just generally about where we are and, and, and where we need to go next, that we, we have some time. And I alluded to this or maybe said this straight, straight out under different agenda items yesterday, um, that, that that's where I think we are. And, and today's discussion has... Um, maintained, I have maintained my confidence during today's discussion that, that that's where we are. So um, I think that uh, I, I still have some questions about the, the timeline of how we could build in some additional workshopping and bring in some additional um, information to kind of get us in a better position for the next steps. Um, and would love some more clarity on that, that aspect of it. Maybe that's a question for NIMS, Josh, uh, whether or not you want to address that. Um, that's kind of where my head is going and, and feeling like we're kind of in this uncertain but uh, okay, stable situation to proceed with specs, but where we're going next um, is of interest to me as well. Josh? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I was about to say your last sentence, so now I'm just trying to struggle with what to, to say. Um, yes, <laughs> I think that's the, I would agree. I think that's the place we're in. We have continually to, as an agency, we review the recommendations from the council and make best scientific information available determinations each time we set those specs. We plan to do that again this time when we review what sort of recommendations come to us. Um, and I think I mentioned this maybe yesterday to alleviate maybe some concern um, and not to um, speak for the Science Center. Um, a lot of these questions are at the top of our minds as well and constant communication between the region and the Science Center trying to figure out where to put sometimes limited resources um, and where can those be directed, I think, to best conserve and manage sardine as that's the the goal here um, and sometimes those priorities will change depending on the size of the stock what the stock is doing um, but i think the agency would welcome a fuller conversation about what we view as our research and science priorities as well as what the council may view as those priorities if that helps answer the question or 
understood the intent of your question, Dr. Braby. Karen Braby. Maybe, a, thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe a follow up question. So, um, follow up on research priorities. When would you see that happening? To the chair, Dr. Baby, in terms of when the agency might be able to provide what we view as research priorities, um, I think that'd be best answered by the Science Center. Dr. Yao did give um, a list of priorities, I believe, last June. Those weren't explicitly highlighted in our presentation yesterday, but um, as far as I understand, those have not changed substantially, uh, but they would be the best people to speak to that. But or we can look back at that, that presentation that support she gave in June. Oh, so Kristen Cook. I don't know if we're putting you on the spot here or not, but <laughs> but I guess we are. Good morning, members of the council. Um, thank you for the discussion on the topic, and I appreciate the council wrestling. I've been listening um, to the discussion uh, between the different members and some of the questions that you're all wrestling with. As Josh indicated, are questions that we are wrestling with as well at the Science Center. And I think, as Josh indicated, we um, put forward some research priorities last June. This, this um, issue related to EMSY was on that list uh, as a, a bit of a longer term priority for us. Um, and that was as it stood last June, I think, you know, I recognize the, the, um, the interest that the council has in the topic. Um, and as we have uh, moved into the stock structure topic and moved through some of the activities that we had planned on there um, in, in terms of a workshop last fall and uh, or earlier this year and um, are continuing as Dr. Yao indicated yesterday, a number of research projects on that topic. Um, this particular one on EMSY, uh, you know, I think deserves uh, additional conversation. And I don't know whether or not this is something we could come forward and talk to the council in greater detail in June, if that's a, a possibility or uh, uh, to, to to look at the various different alternatives and options there for how we might get at this issue and on what kind of a time frame. Um, I think, as usual, workload is is top of mind for for us um, as we talk about frequently in this council, uh, and that's no situation's no different for this topic. But certainly willing to hear what the where this ranks in the council's mind uh, in terms of priority, and we can continue that conversation. Thank you, Kristen. Question. Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Kristen. Maybe not a uh, well a question for for anyone from NIMS, but um, I think I'm a similar of mine. Brianna um, ex ex expressed um, and Karen believe uh, where where we are where we are for this um this this cycle and, and the team has come up with a good recommendation for us but yes looking ahead i guess just summarizing what i've been what i heard um in questions and answers of the team and others was that um we have an emsy that is everyone seems to say is not giving us the signal it's supposed to we have a big issue with with distribution and, and what catches should come off of our ACL, so to speak. But it seems like that the team was recommending we take this up sometime in 2024. And we're coming the Science Center is going to be working on an assessment 
later this year, um, at the end of the year, which we will see in 2024, and they'll be taking up some of these issues as part of that assessment. And when they have that, and the SSC's reviewed it, we, we may know more about wh what to do um, on next steps for these for workshops and giving more attention to these um, bigger questions. I also, I still have a question not to the answer to today, but if the SSC is saying something very wrong, why can't they do something like, like Dr. Shester was saying of using the recent um, recruitment um, rather than just rely on this relationship, everyone was wrong. But I think what I've been hearing is 2024, sometime after the assessment, um, and we can, you know, we can take these issues up under work these longer term issues up under workload planning or um, even maybe November, we have a methodology review shaded on there, which could be expanded. But in, in my, in what I was hearing from in, in Q&A from Josh was in the, in the team was that we're talking, we probably can't do something this year, but but planning for something to happen in 2024 is what we should be looking at. And just wanted to, I'm summarizing what I've heard and um, yeah, asking NIMS to see if, if, if I'm, if I'm hearing that correctly, and we're, we're talking about 2024 and planning for something then and, and most ideally probably after the assessment, given that it's the people involved with the assessment and just what we will learn from the assessment. That was a question for anyone at NIMS, so. If you're looking at me, um, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a a reasonable, a reasonable path forward. Um, so after the, the the assessment, which should happen earlier in 2024, taking this up, um, following that would, I think, be a reasonable timeline. All right. Thank. I'm sorry. No, just rec recognizing I have not uh, had any conversations with my folks on this issue of looking at recruitment, some of the issues that were brought up um, earlier today um, as a, as some kind of proxy. So, you know, I, I just put that out there, but, that, but I think the timeline of identifying this as a research topic in that time frame, frame so, so sort of mid 2024 is, uh, I think we're, what we're looking at, what we're talking about. Thanks, and appreciating that you don't have the new conversations with your folks in order to to manage that. Karen Bravey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm I'm left a little bit confused. I'm clear on you know maybe tackling this in 2024 seems to be like a good option. What I am confused about is when we talk about what we do in 2024, and there's these. The, the pivot point is the 2024 assessment result and whether we can do some discussion before that or whether it's after that. So is it June, 2024 that we will then have the information in hand to then tackle the EMSY slash productivity uh, indices issue? Um, or is there, is there work that we can do this year and, and, what I'm thinking is maybe a, a straw dog of what that timeline looks like in workload planning in June of this year, for example, like if the science center could spend some time thinking about, well, what, what would be possible pathways and, and that could come back to the council in June for, for discussion, just as a workload, a workload issue. So that, I'm confused, not sure whether other council members are, but that's what I'm trying to get my head around. Uh, I mean, I, it may be unfair, but Kristen or Josh, could you, could you respond to that? I realize that maybe getting some information and bringing it back in June may be more helpful, but what information can you provide for us now in terms of clarity and what you can do this year versus next year? Yeah, and th this is, so I had um, hoped to get a little bit more information this morning um, from my division on this, and I, I, I don't have that. So I, I'm a little bit hesitant to commit to what we can do this year, but I recognize the, 
the the confusion that you you have, Dr. Barbie, on this, and would like to have a little bit more clarity on on what we might be able to do um, in 2023 to clarify the path for management in 2024 is what you're getting at, and where if if we put the CMS, EMSY issue. Um, on the tail end of the stock assessment being completed, what does that mean for management in 2024? Uh, thank you. And no, that was not intended. Thank you for clarifying that. It was not intended to change um, the management in 24, 25 cycle, but just what we would do about a workshop or how we would proceed with identifying future improvements in okay. 2024 separate from the management decision that okay. that is happening and if we don't need to do anything this year that's fine i'm just i'm just thinking how are we teeing this up and what are we how are we kind of building that path forward and and, and i don't see it right now i want to get us back to our council action that's on the screen there but uh if there's a further comment we can make here. Go ahead, Phil. Well, I'm just looking that we have a NIMS report on CPS at the June meeting, and maybe you could do some further thinking about this and come back with some additional thoughts that would help us um, identify a path forward on the EMS, EMSY issue. Josh or Kristen, does that seem like an appropriate goal here to come back with that NIMS report and provide the further detail we're seeking here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we could. I don't know if we can be able to provide, and again, this is probably science or anything, much more detail than we're able to provide now, except that having heard this discussion, we're aware that EMSY remains a high priority for the council um, and that we can begin and not to promise resources on the science center side to be thinking more about that topic, highlighting the fact, as I noted earlier, we have been thinking about that topic for um, some sort of future workshop. Um, if the council is looking for specific guidance on what a workshop would look like, uh, I'd be hesitant to promise that for this coming June without an opportunity to have more of a, a brainstorming of what exactly we mean by that that sort of workshop. Um, we didn't really hear that from the SSC. I've heard different things about what that would look like compared to the one we did in 2014, 15. Um, and I think we, we've also heard stock structure and we've heard distribution. And there's some other priorities in terms of continuing to look at the near shore and revise the ATM that remain priorities on the science center side. So I think um, there could be benefit of having a fuller discussion of whether or not EMSY is the thing to move forward with first. Um, not that it won't go forward, but I think that probably colors some of my comments about bringing something in June. Thank you. Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just quickly, I, the other idea I put out there and ask Jesse to um, chime in here. I did have a conversation on just looking at the year at a glance. We're scheduled in November for a methodology review, which apparently we have nothing um, per currently queued up for that. But hearing what Josh is saying, yeah, it, I think the question is going to be what is not just the MSY, what else? But maybe we could take that time in November was the other alternative I put out there to have this type of discussion. But that was the only point I was going to add. All right, so we do have those future touch notes. Um, Vice Chair Hassemer. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. And I, I won't pose it as any question, just my observations. You know, it is frustrating, I guess, to hear that we're not sure about a workshop. It, this isn't the first time we heard about the need to look at the EMSY. And today we heard from our SSC, the management team, the advisory sub panel and the public that you should go ahead and you need to do this workshop to, to sort that out. And it seems to elevate to a, 
a pretty high priority. Um, I appreciate the offer to come back in June and, and talk to us about how that might be. Um, I guess I would just add on the dates, there was a lot of um, 2024 was mentioned very generally that, well, we could do it sometime then. But if I heard things correctly during our reports, there was a question, I believe, to the SSC on when's the right time to do this. And I believe the response was after the assessment was done. The advisory sub panel came back and said, well, you should do it before the next specification cycle begins. So that, to me, that put a couple bookends on. So when we talk about 2024, um, if you come back in June with something that, when could this be wrapped up in more specificity on dates? And so uh, I'll end there, just ex express my, um, I guess, you know, frustration that it, it seems to be extremely important and a high priority and and um, we're just talking about it generally. So thank you. Great, thank you for that. At this point, it uh, seems like all our discussion has been on a potential workshop. We haven't had any discussion on the council action before us. I, I'm going to assume from that that there isn't a need for any discussion until we have a motion. So if there's a motion here, uh, let's get it on the table and then we'll have discussion then. Brianna Brady. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Sandra, may I please have the motion posted? Thank you. I move that the council adopt the OFL of 5,506 metric tons, a P star buffer of 0.4, an ABC tier two of 3,953 metric tons, an ACL of 3,953 metric tons, and an ACT of 3,600 metric tons with the following management measures of um, exempted fishing permit amounts for agenda item H2, attachment one, 150 metric tons, attachment two, 520 metric tons, an incidental landing limit in CPS fisheries of 20%. If landings in the live bait fishery attain 2,500 metric tons, a per landing limit of one metric ton of Pacific sardine per trip will apply to the live bait fishery. If the ACT of 3,600 metric tons is attained, a per trip limit of one metric ton of Pacific sardine applies to all CPS fisheries and an incidental per landing allowance of two metric tons of Pacific sardine and non-CPS fisheries until the ACL is reached. Okay, thank you. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is, thank you. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Karen Bravey. Please speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, as noted by the SSC last November, they intended to consider any new information provided at this meeting, along with the results of the update assessment endorsed in 2022 for providing recommendations for 2023 management. And as such, they recommended rolling over the 2022-2023 OFL, given a lack of compelling evidence that NSP biomass has changed substantially between 2021 and 2022. The SSC also recommended a category two sigma to inform the ABC. And additionally, the directed fishery continues to remain closed to allow for rebuilding and the incidental take allowance and other CPS fisheries continues to be limited to 20%. Um, and looking at the research set asides, I think that highlights that we will continue to work together to improve the science to more fully account for the stock in the near shore and having an ACT in place will allow for small amounts of catch in other CPS fisheries until the ACL is reached. Thanks. Thank you. Questions for the maker of the motion? Discussion on the motion? Brad Pettinger, our yeah. vice chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gromick. And I'd just like to just address the um, exhibit fishery permit amounts and um, how I, I do agree with the amounts you have of worth. And um, there was some uh, consternation about those amounts yesterday in public uh, comment, but it was also pointed out that there's 920 tons available last year and they only used 327 ton. And I expect that to, that would happen again this year is basically the FP folks will use what they need. And so I'm perfectly confident in what we have before us and uh, thank you for the motion. All right, thank you very much. Corey Niles. Um, 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just briefly, well, I think the other in Brad's, um, yeah, thank you for the motion, Brianna. Supportive, I, I think, so where our interest was, was in, in figuring out all of these issues about EMSY and distribution. The other thing, on, on top of the worry is a lot of this, we heard from, as the MT say, we don't know exactly how much, but a lot of the catch is, looks like it could have been coming from this, a different stock that's not even the FMP. So um, that's a big source of confusion and while, while um, yeah, the FP catches were were in the uh, and the catches we are seeing are of looks like of the southern sub stock, but yeah, a lot of issues to work out. And appreciate the, the our discussion earlier about um, finding a, a timeline to do that um, in a rational manner. Further discussion on the motion. Are you not seeing any hands? We'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for the motion, Brianna. So let me look around the table and see if there's further discussion under this agenda item. And I'm not seeing any hands. I think we... Uh, well, now I'll turn to Jesse and find out if we truly have done our business here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, you did complete uh, your action for today. You adopted harvest specifications and management measures for the 23-24 Pacific sardine fishery. So we will work on getting this transmitted to NIMPS for the start of the fishery on July 1. Um, you also had a discussion about you know future priorities for sardine and you know interested in hearing some updates from the southwest fishery science center at a future meeting or in having a another discussion at this so all right well great job we're going to take a break here um is 10 minutes okay and then we'll get started on the next agenda item and then we'll break for lunch is that fair enough it's, it's not ready is it Yeah, but we'll kind of break before we started, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll uh, take our 10 minute break here or so. Uh, let's come back at 1135, and then we'll get started on H5. Uh, we will then, um, it, it looks like we may move up in season. So, ground fish agenda item G4. We will probably take up this afternoon after we finish H5. So you might want to get the word out to all our ground fish people because this is, was originally scheduled for tomorrow, but if we can move it up, we're going to move it up. And our agenda, our salmon agenda item, which was supposed to start the day, E8, will be ready, I'm told, at the end of the day. So we'll come back for H5, then we'll go to in-season, well, we'll have lunch, then we'll complete H5, then we'll go to in-season, then we'll have E8. Because I've yammered on a little bit longer, we'll, we won't come back until um, decades so so today i'm going to provide you with an overview uh with some context of the climate when basin, i got out of high school i jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood project area i didn't have well. a problem getting up and going to work every morning i enjoyed being on the water and when i found that the fishing regulations were so complicated i was angry it is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening, or why is this, or why is that, or they just want to shut it down and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting and uh, very enlightened coming out. MREP gives you the recipe. 
Where does the data come from? How do people use the data? The laws and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation. I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery.
So, uh, one minute warning. All right, so um, we're going to get started here with our next CPS agenda item, and that's the Central Fish Habitat. And for that, I will hand the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. Okay, uh, well, <clears throat> welcome back, everyone. Um, going to go to H5 and have Kerry uh, start us out, and we're probably going to get to his PowerPoint, I believe before we break for lunch so he's promised me it probably won't go much past 20 minutes so i'll go with that so carrie you want to start us off thank you mr vice chair i th i think i said it will take at least 20 minutes but <laughs> hopefully not a lot longer so i'll i'll try to be efficient when i get to the powerpoint but there are some important items that you know i think are worthy of highlighting so uh let's see how we do uh, i think there's about 21 slides in there um, so to the situation summary, this is agenda item H5, Coastal Pelagic Species Essential Fish Habitat Amendment. Um, the council kicked off this EFH review for uh, CPS EFH in 2020. Um, and uh, we all know what happened in April of 2020. So it's been a little bit of a bumpy road since then, but um, here we are now at uh, the point of um, uh, uh, deciding a range of alternatives and possibly a preliminary preferred alternative. And then um, final action is um, scheduled for June. Um, not to get too ahead of myself here. Um, the, uh, the, all of our EFH reviews are divided into two phases. The first phase is designed to uh, gather the information, conduct a literature review and summary and evaluate new and newly available information. And, and if, it, if it warrants, if it indicates that updating EFH is warranted, then you move to phase two and you develop alternatives for consideration. Um, the council adopted a, an action plan per COP 22 um, in June 2022 last year, and we've been operating off that. Uh, the action plan includes a, a scope um, for inclusion in, uh, in in the scope of the review and um, the personnel who will be involved and a, uh, a, and a proposed timeline and schedule. Um, at this meeting, as I mentioned, your task is to adopt a range of alternatives. You could adopt a, a preliminary preferred alternative. Um, you could also um, modify the alternatives or, or, or add an alternative at this meeting. Um, the, this is the meeting to do that, not in June, uh, when we're slated for final action. Um, and... Uh, Oops, thank you. Um, and as far as our materials here, there's the um, attachment one is the draft alternatives document. Uh, and that's what I'll be summarizing in my PowerPoint. Um, supplemental attachment two is a revised or not a revised, it's, it's a new EFH appendix. So right now, um, most of the EFH descriptions are uh, contained in Appendix D to Amendment 8 to the CPS FMP. Um, but if you want to learn about Krill, you have to go amendment to Amendment 12. And so we're trying to consolidate it all into one, um, one FMP amendment. So that's what the, that attachment to is. Uh, and then there's supplemental reports from the Habitat Committee, from the CPSAS and the CPSMT uh, in your materials. So the order of events will be uh, me going through the uh, slides here in a moment, and then the reports and comments of the management entities and advisory bodies, and then public comment, and then to your cancel action, which I already summarized. So that concludes my overview, Mr. Vice Chair. All right. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, questions uh, for Kerry on his overview? Okay. Thank you, Kerry. Okay. So um, 
as I mentioned, I'll, I'll walk through this PowerPoint. It basically summarizes the alternatives document that you have in your briefing book. Um, this has been a team effort between the uh, CPSMT and Council and NIMPS staff and the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. I also want to mention that um, we have some of our uh, key core personnel here. Uh, Dr. Imana Storval of the Southwest Center is here and Dr. Kim Jacobson of the Northwest Center is also here. And then um, Mr. Eric Chavez, who is the West Coast Region EFH coordinators online. So um, if and when we get to technical questions, I may turn to one of them to answer because um, they could probably answer some of those technical questions better than I can. Um, I'll do my best to be efficient here, but there are a few things that I do want to highlight. Um, next slide. And is it in <laughs> slideshow? Right, so a couple of slides just on EFH in general, um, the reviews, well, e on the reviews in general. EFH is defined in the Magnuson Act as those waters and substrate necessary to fish for spawning, breeding, feeding, and growth to maturity. So that's a very broad brush definition. There's a fair bit of guidance that explains those. It talks about what it actually, what does necessary mean? It means that uh, really two components, it, it's necessary to support a sustainable fishery and, uh, and the, the managed species con contribution to a healthy ecosystem. Um, so, and then there's more, there's more uh, uh, um, explanation uh, in uh, the the NIMS Habitat Office guidance document that's referenced here, and there's a couple of boil bullet points here that um, talk about when you're establishing or reviewing EFH. Um, there's a it discourages broad geographic um, designations um, because it sort of loses the value of identifying essential fish habitat. As you'll see, sometimes it's hard to get around that, and you end up with pretty broad. Um, definitions and maps of EFH, but, um, but the idea of these reviews is to sort of refine and revise as you get more information and learn more about these species and their ecology and distribution and all that stuff. Um, next slide. So the councils and, yeah, there we go. Uh, councils and NIMFs are um, required or they should periodically review EFH from time to time and at least uh, every five years per the EFH regulatory guidance. Um, we don't always make that five-year timeline. In fact, I don't know if we ever do, um, but I know that we're in good company with other councils too. It's, it's really hard to do, to stay on that five-year schedule with these EFH reviews, um, but that's a different subject. Um, but overall, the, the objective of the review is to make sure that uh, our EFH provisions are consistent with best available information and science. Um, and then I already talked about the uh, two-phase process. Next slide. So the timeline, I, there's a few uh, touch points not included here, but overall, uh, the phase one report was presented to the council in April of 2021. And the council said, yep, let's move forward with phase two. Uh, and then in June, we brought this phase two action plan forward, which was also adopted uh, in September and January. September 22 and January 23, the CPSMT had meetings. Um, both meetings contained uh, uh, EFH topics um, and decision points for the management team to um, participate in or make recommendations on, especially the January meeting. That was pretty EFH heavy. And then at this meeting, it's the ROA PPA. And then in June, it's the uh, final preferred alternatives. And those will very generally include the, um, uh, a, an updated alternatives document. And then the EFH appendix, which again is the compendium of uh, all things CPS EFH. And then since this would be a, a FMP amendment, we'll also include um, draft proposed FMP language. Uh, next slide. So the, the key issues and decisions that we considered during this review um, were um, the species and assemblage groups. Um, 
up to this point, FinFish and Market Squid are lumped together in the same general EFH definition, um, including spatial extent. But uh, clearly, there are different kind of creatures, and so you'll see how we handled that uh, in a minute. Here um, we have new updated maps. There's this new EFH uh, appendix. Um, and the, the contains a lot of the new information. There's, you know, it's it's a fairly lengthy and includes a lot of uh, good information on life history summaries and distribution and prey and, you know, feeding habitats and things like that. Um, that's all in there. Um, we considered habitat areas of particular concern. There were two that sort of um, floated to the surface as as potential for consideration. One was. Um, the notion of krill hotspots, uh, they do tend to congregate in certain, um, you know, around or near certain um, oceanographic, you know, physical features. Um, and uh, we had a sub team that looked into that and ended up uh, based on, you know, expert information, uh, ended up not moving those forward. It just didn't seem ripe at this time. Um, and there's some explanatory text in the, um, in the alternatives document that so explains more on that. And then the market squid spawning areas, market squid have some dependence on on the physical, uh, you know, uh, benthic substrate for um, for spawning and then egg case development. Um, and and we did move forward that uh, HAPSI that I'll talk about in a little bit. And then also uh, fishing impacts and non fishing impacts are two of the other key components that were included here. Next slide. So here's two slides that just summarize the two alternatives that we're bringing forward to you. Alternative one is uh, basically the, this new EFH appendix, and that will include um, the species and the assemblage groups and their distribution um, and the actual um, the, the definition of their spatial extent and the components of EFH. Page. Um, and um, it'll, it, do, it does include um, a fishing impact section. And uh, right now the appendix has a placeholder for the non-fishing impacts, but that would be replaced with uh, more robust text um, in there. And it includes, like I mentioned, life history summaries and prey species. And then also there's this research uh, and, and data needs. Um, document. Um, and there are some sort of more minor, ed minor editorial changes that, um, you know, that we've identified throughout here that don't warrant a whole lot of floor time, but, um, but, you know, there are, like, there are some references that didn't get in there and um, a few other items um, that we would like to get in before final action. Um, next slide, please. And then the second alternative uh, is very specific and focused on a HAPSI for uh, market squid spawning habitat. That This slide just says market squid, but the HAPSI would be for market squid spawning habitat. Um, and the, the sub uh, alternatives are no action or uh, 2B would be to adopt a HAPSI for market squid spawning habitat. Um, okay, next slide. The next several slides, um, uh, yeah, thank you. The next several slides describe all the components that are in alternative one. So when we get to alternative two, you'll know it, but um, the next several are just all what would be included uh, in alternative one. Um, the, the first one is this the species groupings, as I mentioned. Um, so we, we have really three sort of major groupings that we're considering here. The uh, finfish includes the, the finfish that are in the CPS FMP, the sardine and the PMAC and the northern anchovy and jack mackerel. Uh, and then market squid uh, has its own sort of grouping and um, uh, distribution map. Um, and then with krill, uh, we have, we know a fair bit about two species, Euphausia pacific, and T. spinifera. I need to learn how to pronounce that T. Maybe you can help me, Kim. Um, and, uh, and then all other krill. There's like 39 species of krill or something like that. The, uh, the CPS FMP includes any species of krill that's found in the West Coast EEZ, even if it's not listed in our documents, it is considered included in uh, EFH. Uh, and that was done under Amendment 12 to the CPS FMP. So you'll see um, 
in the um, you know in the the alternatives document and the um, EFH appendix, we list I think eleven specific species that we know some about. It, it's not just those eleven; it's uh, any species of krill. Um, and there's good rationale for breaking it out um, this way that maybe I won't go into, but I think a lot of it is obvious. Fin fish are highly mobile. They're broadcast spawners. They're not dependent on physical substrate, or at least not nearly to the extent as something like uh, market squid is for certain life stages. Um, and then krill is uh, kind of in the same boat there, um, uh, widely distributed, and um, they can be found uh, in, uh, in, you know, varying... Um, you know, densities and, and population amounts um, depending on environmental conditions. So there's a pretty high degree of variability. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the picture of CPS fin fish. And um, you will see that the map uh, showing the proposed uh, EF or spatial extent for CPS fin fish, it's the same that we already have. It's the whole EEC. The CPSMT did take a look at, you know, trying to refine it, looked at uh, in the EFH appendix, there's a bunch of distribution maps and, um, and uh, we did really try to sort of narrow it down uh, per guidance, but given the wide distribution, the migration, the, the widely varying um, population amounts um, of all the different, uh, the different species, uh, we ended up basically um, recognizing that it would, uh, it, it's better to just recommend the whole EEZ and estuaries um, as CPS EFH. But uh, as it is currently described, um, it would be uh, above the thermocline where the sea surface temperature is in that range. So, you know, if you're out somewhere in the middle of the EEZ, deep down below or down below the thermocline that would not be considered cps efh it would be um you know above the thermocline where those sst's are in that range oh and i do want to make one correction um the uh in the alternatives document it, it the figures say that these are based on a generalized additive mixed model a gamm but the, it's not a mixed model. They're based on a generalized additive model, just a GAM. So please remove the second M in your mind from uh, anywhere you see GAMM. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So market squid, EF, you know, there we go. So like I mentioned, we, we broke market squid EFH out of the rest of the uh, uh, CPS assemblage. And so we had to come up with its own spatial extent uh, and the CPSMT um, and the rest of us um, considered a lot of different options. And what we ended up thinking was pretty reasonable was this uh, distribution probably based on uh, Muling's uh, modeling work. Um, and this graphic that you see here shows three different bands of uh, distribution probability for market squid. The red band closest to the shore um, uh, is, uh, I think it's 16 some point something percent up to, or it's greater than, I, I forget what the top end is, but anyway, it's greater than 16% that has the highest probability of squid distribution. And then that middle band where you see the hash marks is uh, sort of that middle range between 5.8% and 16 point whatever percent it is. Uh, and then the yellow part is uh, depicts distribution probability less than 5.8%. So the crosshatch section there is what we propose as uh, the spatial distribution or the spatial extent of squid EFH based on the probability. Um, you know, you don't you don't define you don't identify EFH anywhere that a species is that you'll ever find it. Um, and there's, you know, there's different levels of information you can use on which to base EFH. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this was our way of making a sort of a reasonable, um, um, you know, depiction of where you are more likely to um, find market squid. Yes, we know 
that they go way offshore. We also know they go very deep, um, but this is sort of the higher probability area. And also a couple of uh, those bullet points um, describe what's happening in the water column and in and, and the substrate. So, so EFH would encompass the crosshatched areas. In other words, those two colored bands that are closest to the shore and in the water column down to 300 meters where the SST is between seven and 24 degrees C. Um, and then it would also include soft sandy substrates out to 93 meters of depth. And so what that means is if you were in 75 meters of depth, then you would be in the colored bands. And so the water column would be EFH and the substrate there would be EFH. If you're in a hundred meters of depth, the water column wouldn't be considered, would be considered squid EFH, but not the, the, um, the benthos, not the substrate. Okay, next slide, please. So um, the next three slides are the krill um, EFH um, maps. The, and, and these ended up being exactly the same as they are now. We had a lot of discussion about trying to refine um, uh, those distributions, but um, we ended up uh, recognizing that uh, although there's a lot of new information uh, and references on, on krill and species and habitat and distribution, uh, as far as um, uh, defining the extent of EFH, we ended up with, with basically status quo, what is already in there. And that is that for uh, e Pacifica, it's out to the thousand fathom isobath, down to 400 meters in the water column. Um, and, um, and then those other two bullets aren't, aren't definitions of EFH. They're, they just give an idea of sort of where you're more likely to find these. So, um, yeah, so it's out to a thousand fathoms down to 400 meters of water column depth. Next slide. And T spinifera uh, is out to the 500 fathom isobath down to 100 meters of uh, depth in the water column. So it's a little bit of a smaller footprint than E pacifica. And then next slide. And then all the other krill um, also shares the same um, spatial extent as E pacifica. So it's also out to 1,000 fathom isobath down to 400 meters depth. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a section on fishing impacts. You're required to evaluate fishing impacts that may affect EFH and, um, and identify um, potential conservation measures. So there's a section in the, um, in the EFH appendix on fishing impacts. Because of the nature of CPS, um, because for the most part, they're not dependent on physical habitat features and they're quite highly mobile, um, there's really two um, areas that you could consider fishing impacts. One would be the removal of prey. So if you're a mackerel and you're feeding on baby anchovies or even adult anchovies um, and fishing removes that food source, then that could, uh, in theory, degrade the quality of the habitat. So you could say that's a fishing impact. Um, the other potential impact would be to um, benthic habitats uh, that squid are de dependent on for part of their life stage. So there could be fishing impacts to, to um, the substrate. Um, however, um, as with previous reviews and the original um, um, EFH um, uh, uh, definitions, the, you know, we concluded that, the, that these impacts are no more than minimal or temporary in nature and that, um, you know, although it does discuss, you know, what potential uh, minimization measures you could take, like time and area closures or gear restrictions, uh, there's none of that is proposed um, in here. Okay, next slide. Uh, and then also non-fishing impacts. So right now we have eight um, non-fishing impacts identified in the um, in the EFH Appendix D. Uh, we propose keeping those same eight. And then in 2022, this um, 
this uh, white paper came out of NOAA, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center by Kifney et al. And it is um, a really good compendium of all sorts of uh, fishing activities and potential impacts to habitats for different species. And it also includes um, uh, conservation measures. So that's, um, that's a couple of hundred page document that we feel and the intent is to, to um, to use that document uh, primarily for NIMS biologists when they're consulting on non-fishing activities. So if there's a dredging project in a harbor or a dock building project or oil and gas or exploration, they can go to this both of these documents and and see uh, in general terms at least what the uh, likely impacts are, what some minimization measures are and conservation recommendations. And then in, in the Kifney, um, white paper, there's a whole bunch of other references that then can be used to, um, you know, to help craft conservation recommendations, which is what NIMS does when there's a federally authorized non-fishing um, action. Um, one thing I want to be really clear about is that, um, well, two things. W one is that right now there's a placeholder in the EFH appendix that is basically this table right here. When you see this in June, you will see those first eight bullets fully texted out with the description of the impacts and the text description of minimization or conservation recommendations. I'm proposing, we're proposing incorporating Kifney um, by reference rather than putting in 200 some odd pages into the appendix. Um, so that was one point. You will see the more fleshed out version in June. And then the other point is that just to be clear, uh, a consulting biologist is not bound by what's in here, by what's in the FMP or in Kifney et al. Um, if there's new information or other information that on impacts or conservation measures or that sort of thing, um, they will use that and they will go find the information. So just to be very clear, even if we didn't have any of these non-fishing impacts listed, the NIMS consulting biologist is still going to go find what find out that information, what the impacts are, what the conservation recommendations are, that sort of thing. So this is more of sort of a, a guidebook, provides good information, but it's not the end all be all. It's not completely, um, you know, um, doesn't include every last uh, impact or conservation rec. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we get to habitat areas of particular concern. Um, HAPSIs um, are, they're subsets of EFH. So you can't have a HAPSI if you're not already in within EFH. And the idea of a HAPSI is to highlight a particularly important habitat, or habitat feature that primarily when, well, yeah, to highlight this, and then and then there's two things that could potentially happen. Um, one is the uh, if there are fishing impacts that the council and NIMS thinks would be impacting um, adversely that habitat feature, they could apply some uh, fishing regulations uh, or management measures. That's like our groundfish FMP, where we've identified HAPSIs, established these. Um, um, uh, EFHCAs and in California, the, um, I forget what you call them. They're the green squares on the map. Um, and, and, and so because of the habitat features, we've closed those to bottom trawling or bottom, um, contact information. Um, on the other hand, we have HAPSIs for salmon, but we don't have any management measures. There's no inherent, um, uh, regulatory or regulation that's associated with HAPSIs. Uh, but so then the, then the second element and the more common, um, you know, utility of HAPSIs is during these non-fishing impacts consultations with NIMS, uh, the consulting biologist will say, oh, I noticed that this uh, is, in a, is in an estuary uh, with SAV, which is a HAPSI for uh, many of our species, or it's in a particularly important salmon bearing stream and we have thermal refugia as a HAPSI. So the consulting biologist might take that into account in developing conservation recommendations. It's really a way to sort of highlight, you know, special habitat areas. Um, HAPSIs, we're getting there, a few more slides here. 
uh, HAPSIs are based on these four considerations that are in the EFH regs. I'm not going to read them, but they're listed there. And you, and you need to have at least one of those apply in order to, um, in order to um, uh, develop and um, uh, designate a HAPSI. Um, it, it's, they're really policy choices, though. This is not, there's no like harvest control rule for HAPSIs where you sort of plug in these four considerations and, you know, a yes, no, or a map comes out the other, uh, the other end of the formula. Um, it's, it's, it's really a policy choice. Um, the other thing that I want to mention overall about HAPSIs is that uh, per the NIMS guidance, they, they really should be, the, they should have a specific purpose, not just the habitat needs and the species, but also um, what are you concerned about? What sort of impacts? Are they non-fishing impacts? Is this in an area where there's a new, uh, you know, nuclear plant going to be uh, built or, uh, you know, some other non-fishing impact? Um, or are you concerned about fishing impacts? Um, or is it a, maybe a, a research set aside? Those should be part of the rationale for developing HAPSIs. Next slide. Okay, so here's the, um, the HAPSI proposed for uh, market squid spawning. Um, if you read the alternatives document and the, um, especially the EFH appendix, you'll find a lot of information on, uh, on the types of habitats that, um, that, are, uh, that market squid um, typically use for spawning, which is typically a soft substrate in certain depth range ranges, uh, although um, we also know that they will spawn all sorts of places and not just in these depth ranges that are proposed here. But um, <clears throat> what we ended up doing was uh, gleaning from the EFH appendix, um, these sort of physical habitat features, um, and, and we asked uh, a, um, our GIS analyst to show us a map that would represent uh, the intersection of these. And I'll have a graphic here in a minute to show that. Um, oh, right. I wanted to um, also mention that, you know, the HAPSIs should be relatively limited in geographic scope and they need to be, they're supposed to be discrete areas with clearly defined geographic boundaries. So that was the other thing that we considered here. Temperature and environmental parameters are a really important feature of squid in general and squid spawning, but it's a little bit more difficult to draw a map around temperature. Uh, and so we ended up going with the more sort of physical mappable features. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So this is a, a little graphic that, that shows this intersection, this overlap of, of those features of the sand mud substrate, the depth range, and the locations, which um, show up repeatedly in the literature um, the, in the Monterey Bay, Bay area and the Southern California Bight. Yes, we know that squid live other places and spawn other places, but this is something that you see repeated in the literature. So these are the parameters that we used, and then we looked at the intersection of those three, and that's how we came up with um, the, the draft HAPSI maps. Next slide, please. So here are two draft HAPSI maps um, that show where the intersection of those uh, features are. That's Monterey Bay. Um, and then next slide, please. <clears throat> And then that's the Southern California Bay. You can see those darker areas. Those slides are a completely different scale, so it kind of, the Monterey Bay map makes it look sort of bigger, like a bigger hapsi than it does here, but um, they're they're not to scale. <clears throat> okay, that is it for hapsi. So next slide, please. Um, right. So here's a summary of the potential modifications here. One is the refined species complexes. We pulled squid EFH out, updated non-fishing uh, impacts, um, the HAPSI for market squid. There's a lot of updated life history summaries and references, as I mentioned. Uh, we want to consolidate all this into one sort of um, EFH appendix. So there's one-stop shopping. 
And then that last bullet is, is those um, um, components that we were not proposing substantial changes. Krill EFH is the same, FinFish EFH is the same, uh, and then the fishing impacts and conservation measures um, are the same as they were before. We're not proposing any new impacts or conservation measures. <clears throat> um, so this gets us to uh, your action for today, or I'll summarize the action. I know we'll talk about it later in the agenda item too. Um, but again, you know, you're, you need to adopt a range of alternatives. You could adopt a PPA, you could propose modifying or adding an alternative. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there's several uh, minor edits that we'll make. Like there's some Diff, there's sometimes in the merit in the EEZ boundaries between Canada and Mexico. Sometimes we refer to them as borders. Sometimes we refer to them as maritime boundaries. So I think we'll get we'll strive for some consistency, things like that. Um, mm, yeah. Okay. And actually, that's my last slide. Oh, there's one more slide. My thank you slide. <laughs> Iman Estorval and Eric Chavez and Kim Jacobson, Stephanie Onisco made the maps for us uh, and the CPSMT did an awful lot of work on this. So I just wanna acknowledge uh, all those people. And that concludes my overview. Thank you, Gary. Very, very informative. Um, questions for Gary on his own I guess you're all hungry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with that, we'll stop here and we'll come back. Um, let's go, let's go back at 1.30, use a little extra time there. So, okay. So, all right, we'll see everybody then.
The recording has stopped.
This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Well, welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, prior to lunch, uh, Kerry gave his overview in the PowerPoint uh, presentation. And um, with that, next up will be the um, Dr. Jacobson giving the uh, CPS management team report. So welcome again. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. Chairman and members of the council, good afternoon. My name is Kim Jacobson. I am with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center and I'm representing the CPSMT. I will be reading to you today, agenda item H5A, the supplemental CPSMT report, coastal pelagic species management team report on coastal pelagic species essential fish habitat amendment. Since the Pacific Fisheries Management Council adopted the phase two action plan for coastal pelagic species, essential fish habitat, the CPS management team and a dedicated team comprised of Council, National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region, and NIMS Southwest Fishery Science Center staff have developed a draft EFH appendix and accompanying alternatives document for Council review. Specifically, the CPSMT would like to recognize and thank Dr. Amanis Dorval with the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, Mr. Kerry Griffin, your council staff, 
and Mr. Eric Chavez of the NIMPS West Coast Region for taking on the bulk of investigation and new content creation. The CPSMT provided feedback and edited these documents over the last several months. The CPSMT offers the following comments on the range of alternatives being considered. Alternative one, new EFH appendix. The CPSMT endorses council adoption of alternative 1B, the new EFH appendix, as the pre preliminary preferred alternative with the following modifications. The Habitat Committee's report, agenda item H5A, supplemental HC report one, recommends including the Salish Sea as EFH for both market squid and krill. The CPS, CPSMT supports consideration of these modifications for final action. Number two, incorporate updated fishing impacts and conserva conservation measures into the EFH appendix, as Mr. Griffin spoke to this morning. And then also the minor corrections as appropriate, which you heard this morning as well. Alternative two, market squid habitat areas of particular concern. At the CPSMT meeting in La Jolla, California in January, the team discussed potential habitat areas of particular concern for CPS and reviewed the four considerations described in the CF CFR to guide our identification of HAPSES. These include the importance of the ecological function provided by the habitat, the extent to which the habitat is sensitive to human-induced environmental degradation, whether and to what extent development activities are or will be stressing the habitat type. And finally, the rarity of the habitat type. Given that the identification of HAPSIs are based on one or more of these considerations, the CPSMT thought investigating HAPSIs for market squid spawning adults in Monterey Bay and within the Southern California Bight was worthwhile based on the importance of the ecological function provided by the habitat, the potential extent to which the habitat is sensitive to human-induced degradation, and the possibility and extent to which development activities are or will be stressing the habitat. As such, the CPSMT proposed as an alternative to designate a HAP HAPSI for squid spawning that would include areas within the Southern California Bight and possibly Monterey Bay with sand or mud benthic habitat within a depth range of 13 to 93 meters. The purpose of this potential HAPSI designation would be to address non-fishing impacts on spawning habitat. If the council chooses to move forward with alternative two, the CPSMT provides the following points for council consideration while evalu evaluating whether these areas are appropriate to designate as HAPSIs. And after much, much discussion on to be or not to be, I have the following points. Several peer-reviewed publications either identify or refer to habitat in southern Monterey Bay as an important spawning area for market squid. The manuscript by Zeidberg et al. also identifies spawning grounds using a remotely operated vehicle around the China, Channel Islands. And I apologize that the full references for these four scientific documents did not get added to this statement, but um, they can be made available and they are also in the appendix. Temperature and other environmental factors are important drivers of squid spawning distribution and success. The Habitat Committee recommended adding temperature parameters in the HAPSI description. If the Council moves forward in considering HAPSIs for market squid, the CPSMT supports this addition of temperature. Squid, however, are dynamic in nature and will go wherever habitat is ideal moving and adapting with changing temperature conditions. Much of the available data on squid spawning grounds are obtained from areas where significant fishing activity occurs, representing only grounds accessible to and favored by fishing boats. As such, other spawning grounds may exist, and designating discrete spatial areas as hapsies for squid may not be warranted. And that concludes our statement. Thank you. Okay. Questions for the um, management team? Report? Rihanna Brady? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Kim, for reading the report. Um, I just wanted to ask 
if the MT feels that a HAPSI is needed for SQUID? I would like to say that um, we did not come to a consensus in the management team. Thank you, Brianna. Anyone else? All right. Oh, Corey Wright. Um, <laughs> Corey. Um, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, uh, Kim, for the and the team for the thoughts here. I guess um, I tend to think of EFH less as a management fisheries management tool and less, as Carrie pointed out in the overview, that it's a um, a particular uh, identified as a fisheries closure. So do you, do you and thank you, yeah, the report here and um, maybe not absorbing it at all, but do you, are you worried at all about um, management implications here of, of two fisheries for those who are not in favor of, of, of HAPSIs or is it more based on some of the concerns we've heard else about the, or will hear about Maybe we don't identify all of them. They're kind of tough to define. So, so are there point is there are the fishery management implications that you are that that were discussed the team as being a concern? We did not discuss management fishery management implications with HAPSIs within the team. We discussed the uncertainty of other habit spawning habitats that haven't been identified and the dynamic nature of market squid. But as a team, we didn't address implicate management implications on fisheries. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Yep. Very good. Um, next up, the, um, the CPS AS report and Anna Weinstein. Anna, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. I'm Anna Weinstein. Uh, it's nice to be here in person. Um, I will be reading into the record the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Coastal Pelagic Species Essential Fish Habitat Amendment. The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel reviewed the Essential Fish Habitat Range of Alternatives Report and the draft EFH, EFH appendix. As we noted in June 2022, Massive development proposals threaten CPS habitat, survey activities, and fishing access, underscoring the urgent need to complete this EFH review using the best available information and employing new analyses. So we appreciate the collaborative efforts of the <clears throat> of NOAA's Southwest Fishery Science Center, in particular Dr. Dorval, council staff, and the CPS management team to develop these alternatives and documents. For alternative one, we recommend 1B as the preliminary preferred alternative, which would create three categories of EFH for finfish, squid, and krill, as well as the proposed EFH configurations, including their depths and aerial extents. We also support including in the PPA, the recommendations of the Habitat Committee to include the Salish Sea and the definition of EFH for squid and krill. The EFH configurations are well supported by published information and our knowledge and reflect the desire of the council to consider the dynamic nature of EFH, embodied in the fact that the most CPS influenced by temperatures, food availability, availability and currents move throughout the, the EEZ and use some coastal bays and estuaries. The thorough analysis indicates in integrated satellite and survey data to include the range of CPS life history features, including spawning, seasonal migration, and infection. A non-fishing impact section should be included in EFH appendix prior to taking final action, as requested by the Council Habitat Committee and the, and the CPSAS in June of 2022. The section should include general principles guiding the Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service in assessing the potential impacts of proposed projects, a list of non-fishing impacts, and a discussion of specific conservation measures that would aid in minimization or avoidance of the adverse effects. In relation to offshore wind energy development, while Kifni et al. 22 addresses offshore wind impacts, it lacks mention of a major threat to CPS posed by offshore wind, 
that is alteration of meteorological and hydro hydrological regimes, currents, and temperatures due to removal and alteration of wind energy in the CCE. This should be documented in the new EFH appendix. For alternative two, we greatly appreciate the team's exploration of habitat areas of particular concern, which we requested in 2022, and its presentation of two potential hapses for market squid in Monterey Bay and the Southern California Bight. The proposed squid hapses were selected as being of special importance to support squid spawning and survivorship. However, squid spawn in soft bottom areas throughout the EEZ above 1,000 meters. Throughout this habitat type, reproductive success and survivorship is linked by to environmental conditions and drivers, including temperature and upwelling driven nutrient production. The CPSAS believes there was insufficient analysis to support alternative 2B at this time, and we believe there's insufficient information to support the proposed locations uh, as of special value to spawning over other areas within squid EFH. Therefore, we support alternative 2A no action as the PPA. Just to better inform future EFH and HAPSEEK considerations, we encourage the council um, to include the following research and data need. Uh, in the PPA. Conduct further research on the life cycle of squid and the importance of each day to the success and productivity of squid. This research should include examining the relative importance of habitat features as well as environmental and oceanic conditions at each life, life cycle stage. Thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Uh, questions on the CPSAS report? I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Anna. Okay, next up will be the uh, Habitat Committee and uh, Dr. Green and um, Corey, are you there? I am, can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. I'm gonna be reading agenda item H5A, supplemental HC report one. HC's report on coastal pelagic species essential fish habitat amendment. The Habitat Committee discussed the essential fish habitat information and proposed range of alternatives prepared for the coastal pelagic species EFH review and agendum item H5A. H5. The HC commands Dr. Amanis Dorval and the coastal pelagic species management team for its work updating and synthesizing life history and habitat information for CPS species and identifying a potential habitat area of particular concern. This body of information will inform future conservation efforts in support of sustainable CPS fisheries. The HD provides the following comments and recommendations. Alternative 1B, adopt a new EFH appendix with updates to several CPS EFH components. The HD agrees with separate EFH descriptions for market squid and the fin fish assemblage given the narrower depth range for market squid and their dependence on benthic habitat for spawning. Egg incubation and development. Separate EFH descriptions will also help tailor EFH consultations and habitat conservation measures for non-fishing impacts. The HC supports including alternative 1B as a preliminary preferred alternative. Market squid and krill EFH in the Sailor Sea. The HC recommends that maps and descriptions depicting the distribution of market squid and krill be extended into the Sailor Sea. Pelagic and benthic areas similar to the areas in the proposed EFH description for squid and krill, such as Euphasia pacifica, exist within the Salish Sea, and both groups are common there. Market squid are a common pelagic species and subject to a year-round recreational fishery which peaks mid to late fall. You can find uh, information of that on the at web, website that I've provided. Krill also commonly occur in the Salish Sea and E. Pacifica has been extensively sampled in zooplankton monitoring efforts. As noted in the EFH regulations and guidance documents, EFH should be defined carefully, keeping in mind that EFH means that habitat requires to support one, a sustainable fisheries and two, the managed species contribution to a healthy ecosystem. While the exclusion of the Salish Sea for squid and krill might be acceptable relative to point number one above, the HC notes that these species are important to commercially managed salmon stocks in Puget Sound as prey in the case of krill and as an alternative food source for predators of salmon in the case of market squid. Hence, from an ecosystem function standpoint, the existing literature supports extending the distribution of market squid and E. pacifica into the Salish Sea. Alternative 2B, adopt HAPC designation for market squid and spawning habitat. 
Based on the best available science and input from subject matter experts, evidence exists for market squid spawning habitat in coastal soft bottom substrates of the Southern California Bight, including the Channel Islands and in Monterey Bay. The HC notes that spawning areas delineate delineated in the HAPC map for the SEB appear to accurately mirror the spatial areas identified in the published work by Zeidberg et al. The recurrence of spawning activity at these locations and dependence on substrate for spawning supports a HAPC designation. As described in the draft CPS FMP EFH appendix, Adult squid concentrate in dense schools at these spawning grounds where females deposit high numbers of fertilized egg capsules and individually attach each capsule to the substrate. Aggregated egg clusters can occupy up to 3,000 meters squared within a single communal site and can persist for more than a month as eggs develop. Although spawning is known to occur elsewhere on the West Coast, there is sufficient information to delineate spawning habitat, HAPSI, in the areas proposed. Spatial dis delineation of spawning habitat for both Southern California Bight and Monterey Bay may benefit from evaluating additional sand and mud substrate classifications in the Coastal and Marine Ecological Classif Classification Standard, or CMEX, hierarchy. Spawning habitat meets the HAPSI consideration of important ecological function defined in EFH regulations and could be possibly stressed by development activities. In accordance with EFH guidance, the HC believes an appropriate purpose for this HAPC designation would be as an important conservation tool for federal and state evaluations of non-fishing impacts, such as aquaculture opportunity areas located near market squid spawning habitat in the Southern California Bight and offshore wind leases. The HC supports the HAPSI designation for market squid spawning habitat in the Southern California Bight and Monterey Bay presented in an alternative 2B for inclusion as a PPA. The HC recommends evaluating additional CMEX classifications to delineate the HAPSI in the Southern California Bight and Monterey Bay. The HC notes that temperature is an important driver for spawning in market squid. Zeidberg et al. found Spawning occurred directly on benthic substrates in temperatures ranging from 10 to 14 degrees off California. The HC recommends that temperature parameters be included in the HAPSI description. HAPSI designation for other CPS species. The HC discussed whether there was sufficient information to designate HAPSI for jack mackerel and two krill species, E. pacifica and T. spinifera, given the information on habitat associations provided in the draft CPS EFH appendix. As discussed, the consensus among CPS subject matter experts is that there is insufficient information at this time to recommend HAPSI designation for these species. The HC su suggests additional research would be needed to inform the next CPS review. And finally, on research and data needs, the HC agrees with the research and data needs item noted in H5 attachment one. The HC notes additional habitat-specific information groups, some of which were also identified in the research and data needs document. The HC recommends including the following CPS EFH research needs. Evaluate the effects of fishing on habitat, determining, determine whether climate change and ocean, ocean acidification pose differential risk to invertebrates, such as squid and krill, compared to finfish in the CPS group. Determine further research necessary to describe, identify, and map EFH of CPS. Further investigate habitat features as potential HAPSI for E. pacifica and T. spinifera. Evaluate the importance of krill habitat compression to restricted geographic areas during environmentally stressful conditions and whether a HAPSI designation should be considered, especially where subject to human-induced environmental degradation and determine the optimal range of carbon chemistry for krill life stages as a component of EFH. I've also included here um, the citations that were reported in our, in our larger report. And I'll take questions, thank you. Uh, all right, questions on the Habitat Committee report? Corey Niles. Uh, 
thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Corey, and thanks to the Habitat Committee for the thorough report here. Um, thinking on the um, the HAPC question and, and Carrie's overview and your report here on, and the difference between krill and squid. Um, so I think I think if I understand what, what you all are saying is that um, we do suspect that hapsies for krill do exist. There are particular places in the ocean where they they are found in higher abundance. It typically, um, it, we just don't know where they are with much confidence at, at this point. And a squid, while we know a little bit more, um, we're still uncertain. Any, can you, can you, um, if, if that is the question rattling around in my mind, can you, can you uh, compare and contrast those, the, the two situations a little, just uh, to help the thought process here? Yeah, my understanding is that uh, krill, um, there's a lot of work that have gone into this, this work, and there's definitely supporting documents to that, except there's pretty big uncertainty bounds. And uh, so the um, that so do so basically, we think there's more research is necessary to really nail nail that question down, and so that's why uh, we highlighted a couple of those issues in the research and data needs. Uh, on the question of a squid, we think there are, are is good evidence for at least those areas we uh, talked about: Southern California Bite and Monterey Bay for um, a hapsi for uh, based on squid spawning. Um, and those, those habitats might occur elsewhere, but the published literature really supports these, these two areas most strongly. Thanks for the question. Corey? Uh, thank you for that answer, I guess. And then so to the argument that maybe those two areas are important, but they aren't the only important, doesn't imply that they're only the, the only important areas in the ocean. Um, can you just re-articulate what the committee's response to that argument would be? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, can, try, can try to do a little bit better and might call on, um, on uh, my uh, expert uh, with EFH, uh, Eric Chavez to address this as well, is that um, the, basically the idea of invoking a HAPSI really depends upon strong scientific knowledge. And the, the strength of the scientific knowledge currently is located in those two general areas. That doesn't um, eliminate other possibilities and in future uh, iterations of EFH with additional research that have been done, maybe inspired by some of this work in Southern California, those, um, those could be included at another time. But currently, the research is really highlighting these areas um, uh, as, as strong candidates. And I'll invite Eric Chavez to elaborate if he has any further points. Yeah, I, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. Um, yeah, I think you covered it pretty well, Corey. Um, you know, we talked about the different HAPSI considerations, then you definitely want to have, a, a, you know, a justification for that uh, in the available literature. And I guess I would stress that, you know, even if you don't know, you know, everywhere where that particular life stage, that habitat is important. It doesn't mean that you can't um, stress the importance of the areas that you do know about. And so looking at the literature, those were the two areas in general that had the most um, support or evidence in the literature. So that's why we focused on them for market squid. Um, yeah, I think that's that covers it. Hey, Corey, anyone else? Oh, oh Bob Dewey? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> Just a question to, it seems like that's the, the data is being derived from the, where the majority of the fishery is to make the data complete. But it also says that that habitat could be anywhere up and down the coast that, you know, and there's areas obviously that we don't have a, a lot of fishing, some fishing, 
but not to the level of data. I question whether the, the, how this designation really uh, protects anything more than just the EFH designation and, and why we would, without, the, without knowledge of the whole coast, why would we start here? Why would we do this, doing it in that area? I, I'm really concerned myself over the impact to fisheries ultimately, because I've seen it happen in other areas, perhaps these are, but why, uh, I guess my question is, it seems like the whole coast is habitat and it's in the FH, but these areas are being singled out because there's a lot of data to support it. And I, I don't know that uh, it's any more necessary, any, you know, is it more necessary somewhere else or is it, uh, um, or is it covered already under EFH? I mean, it looks like the depth provisions are already there. So questioning that, that and, and the justification for it. Eric, uh, I, I have one thought. Um, that's, that's a good question and thank you for the question. Uh, I'm gonna let Eric handle it for starters. And if uh, I, I have one additional thought after that, perhaps. Eric, why don't you go? Sure, thank you. Um, Again, this is Eric Chavez, the NIMS West Coast Region EFH coordinator. I don't know that I said that last time. Um, yeah, I, I think from a broad perspective, just to remind the council that, you know, designating a HAPSI doesn't come with any additional regulatory burden. Um, it's, it's merely intended to focus conservation efforts, um, and that can include fishing, uh, but also non-fishing impacts or research needs. I think a lot of folks think about um, some of the ground fish hapsies and some of the management measures that resulted from that. Uh, but there's, you know, within the regulations and the guidance, it clearly states that management measures aren't inherent with a hapsie designation. And I think it's worth noting that nothing in the literature pointed to fishing impacts to market squid um, spawning habitat that warranted, um, you know, a, a fishery management measure. So at this point, there's no evidence for that. And then I guess to answer your question, um, yeah, again, there, since it's just intended to focus conservation um, efforts, some of that data was certainly, I think, associated with fishing activity, but not all the references in there are um, fishery dependent. There's certainly some fishery independent information in there as well. So um, there's a combination of the two. And again, it would just be to, if you identify this as a HAPSI, for instance, for the importance of its ecological function, and then you could potentially use that during an EFH consultation process for a non-fishing impact. Um, again, just for you know, focusing your conservation efforts, perhaps scrutinizing that project, if it's potentially going to impact a HAPSI that's designated. Um, and although there are areas you know, that, you know, beyond what's been identified in that HAPSI description that are probably used for sp as spawning habitat at times, it is a narrower band or a subset of the market squid HAPSI EFH designation that's proposed that would represent the HAPSI. So it's a subset, it's a smaller area where you'd be focusing those conservation efforts. Hopefully that answered your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks for the, thanks for the answer, I appreciate it. One follow up there, in particularly the Monterey Bay area, uh, don't we have a lot of protection already in eight with just the the fact that there's it's a marine sanctuary that would that would protect from other uh, outside uses, so to speak, or other uses of the the marine area. There's it seems like there's a lot of protection just in that, as opposed to making a special uh, EFH area. Just for just for squid. Is it? Um, I hope there was a question in there. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I would say that, um, as Eric Chavez noted, there's no additional protections other than from the EFH considerations for the entire um, area. So, um, so, in that respect, um, the HAPSI designation would not would not elevate the level of protection. But I think what it would do is highlight sort of for local agencies who are managing other um, aspects of, of conserved habitat in Monterey Bay, those, are, those areas would uh, sort of from a local interest standpoint become elevated. 
Thank you, Bob. Cor Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Corey and Eric. Um, this is, I guess, your third Corey of the day, uh, Corey <laughs> Writings. <laughs> um, I'm going to maybe pick a little bit at where Bob went with his first question, which was, um, it sounds like what I'm understanding is, you know, the, the science available doesn't cover the entire EEZ, which is the EFH. And understandably, it's a very large area. Um, but i wondering if you could expand a little bit on your methodology about how you landed on the areas that you did land on and sort of how wide of a net you cast there and um, how you came down to sort of land on, on these kind of two main areas. I hope that makes sense. Thanks. That does make sense. Thank you. I will turn to Eric for that question. Sure. Hi. Um, thank you for the question. Um, what what we did was essentially follow what was in the literature. So as, as Carrie mentioned before, you know, there's this whole phase two process. So a lot of what we based our phase two um, on was what was turned up in the phase one report and those references. So looking at those references, um, the ones that uh, were used to update the market squid, um, life history, habitat preference descriptions, et cetera, those ones all... Um, focused on the Monterey Bay area, the uh, Channel Islands, and the Southern California Bight. So, you know, although there is, you know, within within the literature, I th there was some reference to kind of broader coastal areas. For the most part, those were the ones, um, geographically speaking, that seemed to stand out. Um, and I should probably note that, you know, there is guidance um, regarding designating HAPSIs, the, the NIMS procedure that Carrie referenced previously that says, you know, you should try to make them uh, discrete with clearly defined geographic boundaries. It does allow for qualitative descriptions when you're not able to do that. Um, but so when you're designating HAPSIs, in my personal opinion, it helps when you can refine them so that they are truly subsets of a broader EFH designation. And so since those were the two areas that um, seem to stand out, um, the CPS management team uh, and, and myself, the others that were involved, seem to think that those were the two that warranted a closer look. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Um, all right. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That takes, um, takes us to public comment. I believe we have two people signed up. I believe we have uh, Jeff Shester in person, or um, he's actually online, followed by um, Mark Fina. So, Jeff, are you there? Yes, can you hear me okay, Mr. Vice we Chair? We can. We can. Great. Th thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is uh, Jeff Shester representing Oceana. Um, sorry, I did have to uh, take off to go home, head back to Monterey, um, but it was uh, great to see you all in person over the last couple of days. Um, we wanted to uh, support the statements um, made both by the Habitat Committee and the, the management team. We, uh, we also agree with the CPS AS that having uh, an additional section and making sure that section is added that, that goes into non-fishing impacts as, um, as Ms. Weinstein described is very important and we support that. Um, with respect to EFH uh, description and designation, we support alternative 1B, uh, including updated krill and market squid uh, descriptions and identifications, as well as those additional areas that were mentioned by the management teams. Um, uh, on those descriptions as well, uh, this, this issue of offshore wind impacts and strengthening, uh, I think, could be done uh, as in, uh, it's possible to describe what specific components of uh, EFH are, um, uh, you know, are, are part of the designation and specifically adding uh, upwelling and you know, ocean uh, hydrology and circulation as a component of EFH and listing potentially wind energy as a potential threat. This could be very helpful in more explicitly pushing agencies like BOEM to analyze uh, 
these potential impacts as they're doing uh, their analyses and draw better attention to some of those potential impacts. And so we really supported the AS statement on that and urge us an explicit maybe uh, uh, mentioning that of, of upwelling as a component of the EFH designation that is EEZ wide for CPS. Um, we support uh, with respect to alternative two in the market squid HAPSI. Uh, we support the, the concept. Uh, we do note that we felt that it could also benefit from additional refinement and analysis to provide a, a stronger rationale. Um, I was impressed just hearing the discussion by uh, uh, Mr. Chavez and others about the rationale, but I, I think that the management team provided some uh, good uh, recommendations for things that could happen between now and final action to, to better uh, analyze and kind of lay that out. And so we want to support the management team's recommendations and ask that this be moved forward. Uh, we, we do believe that um, uh, let's, you know, let's do the best we can with the science that we do have, knowing that there are five-year EFH reviews every five years, and we can continue to build and improve based on the science and potentially add additional areas uh, over time as the science improves. So it's not just a, uh, we don't have to kind of figure it out perfect now, but be, you know, doing something that could be uh, helpful as a, as a conservation tool now uh, that we can build on later, we support that concept. We, we, we believe it specifically, it's an important tool to address non-fishing impacts. So we're think, thinking about things like desalination, runoff, wastewater and sewage, pollution, water quality impacts, aquaculture, uh, offshore structures and disturbance to sea seabeds uh, from non-fishing impacts. Th th this would this would provide a greater level of uh, protection in any EFH consultations uh, that go above and beyond uh, protections that may already exist, like sanctuary designation, etc. Um, we we believe that uh, certainly this is a the the HAPSI makes sense uh, for for market squid specifically because it's talking about a seafloor substrate, so it is a a tangible, tangible area that can be described. It is a subset of EFH. It meets the HAPSI criteria for ecological function and importance and potential threats that are growing. Um, we've noted that in our experience, um, groundfish HAPCs that were designated in the groundfish EFH process uh, include habitats like kelp, rocky reefs, estuaries, eelgrass. And we've, we've actually directly experienced this being very helpful uh, in EFH consultations for non-fishing impacts, particularly like in Humboldt Bay for oyster aquaculture, those areas that had HAPSI designation, uh, there was a lot more scrutiny and attention paid to those. And so we've seen the direct benefits that HAPSI designation can, 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 can be in dealing with these non-fishing impacts. And again, echoing some of the comments that Mr. Chavez made about the value of HAPSIs above and beyond um, uh, other things while, while at the same time, um, you know, we're not expecting or, or requesting any sort of regulatory, uh, anything regulatory with respect to the HAPSIs in terms of any fishing impacts. So in the, uh, in, in summary, we, we actually, you select alternative 1B as your PPA for the EFH designation for CPS, uh, along with your more explicit description of the upwelling as a component. Uh, and then also that you request the additional analyses on alternative 2B for the market squid HAPSI and, and see what the, the team can come back with um, and, and wait to kind of decide on any PPA uh, at this meeting um, and, and wait to see what the team could come back with uh, before final action so that potentially some of the concerns and, and a more robust rationale for the HAPSI designation for market squid can be can be considered at that time. Uh, thank you very much for your efforts uh, on, on CPS, Central Fish Habitat, and, um, and, and, and all your work at this meeting. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for uh, Jeff on his testimony? Okay, thanks, Jeff. Next up would be Mark Fina. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm Mark Fina for uh, CWPA. I I'm here to testify pretty much only on the squid hapsi issue. Um, I guess when I look at the issue and step away from it, I, I look at hapsi as being specific areas that are that are particularly important, and and I just have I don't see that in what is before you now. The way the document was put together, 
you focused on two geographic areas and you probably found uh, 75 percent of what you looked at to be hapsi or to and i guess i think if you extended your reach a little more you would find a similar expansion up the coast where most of the coast contains the soft substrate that's been identified as important as you kind of take the next step with it and talk about well, when is it important when is this spawning occurring you can see that it moves up and down the coast with temperature with upwelling so we've seen fisheries in oregon where fishermen have seen fish seen squid there in sufficient quantities to fish on them you've seen them north of monterey bay in areas where people fish on them but for some reason we didn't look at those areas i think if you actually opened the inquiry to look at them, you would find similar conditions there and that really the driver is environmental conditions. Um, you, you added EFH to, in Puget Sound to this action just now for the same reason, because you look there and you found similar conditions and similar squid quantities, you know, squid that should be concerned about. So I feel that that what what I take away from this is spawning is probably spawning grounds where squid will spawn is probably not the right thing to be looking at here um they occur up and down the coast they uh you see big quantities of squid and when the conditions are right in the in in, in any area up and down the coast so what it leaves me looking at is thinking well maybe there aren't specifically important areas that lend themselves to the geographic definition that you're looking for for a hapsi I mean, I don't know if it's possible, but if you decided you wanted to do that, I think you probably need to step back from it and say to yourself, okay, let's look at the life cycle of a squid in, of squid and start to identify what are the critical periods. If I talk to fishermen, they talk about huge quantities of, of eggs up and down the coast. I hear people of people, you know, diving in areas where you probably don't have hapsies now who see nice big squid beds and they go diving to look at them. And it makes me wonder, is spawning really the driver of success of squid? Or is it something in between when they've in between when they've hatched and when they've matured? That really is the driver. And I, I really think looking at the life history and looking at the different stages and the importance of habitat and life history will get you a better picture of what's important than just saying we know they spawn in soft substrate so let's look at that as the driver i think if you if that endeavor alone leaves you with a lot of questions that are answered and i um i guess to to hit on it, it, it i don't think when i look at the criteria I'm not seeing the importance of these specific areas. I know that people fish there, but I also know they fish elsewhere. And I know squid are present in a lot of areas where nobody fishes because they're too far from ports. They aren't particularly sensitive habitat. It's, you know, the report says, says that they aren't particularly susceptible to stress, that the, the stress of development, I know they can be. And I know that if an action goes forward, that's something we want to look at, but we've got EFH to do that. And they aren't particularly rare. So I, I just am not seeing the criteria applying the way that they should be to select HAPSI. I think HAPSI is supposed to be something somewhat unique. And I don't see this as being particularly unique. Um, and, and I just, it, it doesn't get there yet. Now, maybe there is a way to get there if we broaden our inquiry a little bit and, and really take a hard focus on what is important, not just can we find a place where they spawn, because we know we can do that. And they even spawn in rocky areas that aren't included in this. And it, it just isn't clear to me that we've identified something important here. And that's what a HAPSI is for. You've got EFH already that covers uh, the coast, which... Um, it, it, but I just am not seeing this, this meeting the criteria that you're asking it to meet, at least in its current form. And thanks. That's all I have. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Questions for Mark on his testimony? Corey and I ask. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I guess I mean, ask the same questions. I'm not, I'm just because I'm missing something. Um, we have our habitat committee who in the EFH corner for NIMPS saying that the evidence fishery dependent and independent lens towards the fact that these areas are important um 
not saying they're not they're not we haven't identified everywhere that's important but like the, like as um Corey Green was saying if there's some local authority in Monterey Bay um what is the harm in highlighting that the evidence suggests that a particular that particular area is an important spawning ground to squid why would that local authority care that that's not the only area and I guess other, your other thought, like if, if um, they're not particularly unique, kelp, I don't think kelp forests are particularly unique. Maybe they are becoming more unique. Yeah, in, in groundfish, um, they are hapsies. Uh, you know, eelgrass are hapsies. Um, we have a lot of salmon habitat that, again, degraded a lot where it used to be, but it's important. So the thing is we want, lo we want people who are developing and having a, a, um, effects on those habitat to consider what those effects might be. So... That was a lot more than a myth, but like, what's the harm in having in that one hypothetical a local uh, a pro local project considering how it might affect kelp forest, eelgrass, um, squid spawning grounds? Even though, because why would they really care if we've identified all the areas everywhere? That's a great question, and and I think the real issue that you get to with hapsies is um, just comes out of the name particular concern and really what you should be looking for are areas that have some unique property that makes them especially concerning and that's where i think you kind of if it's if everything is important nothing is important and i think that's where we get to if we really take this to where it should be taken because i personally don't think that you should designate a hapsi as a geographically important area by limiting your inquiry geographically which i think we did in this case there is good evidence that if you look that fish that squid spawn up and down the coast the entire coast we chose to just identify two areas and say this is where we want to look and if you only look in a couple areas you can limit your you can limit your geographic scope pretty easily um and I think if you really took a look at what the habitat, what habitat there is up and down the coast and where squid spawn, you will find that there are lots of places where they spawn in significant quantities. And I, and I think if you just go ahead and do that, you kind of lose the weight of hapsi. The purpose here is to actually identify areas that are critical and if you designate at all, you've kind of lost the weight of that. And I think it's, you know, it, it doesn't help somebody. I mean, if, if I'm somebody who's going in as a developer and you tell me that you've designated 75% of the coast as Hapsi, I'd say, ah, oh, you still have a huge amount if I develop this. It's not going to hurt you very much because you still have the rest of the coast that's are also Hapsi. So it's not really that important. So I think it's, I think to carry the weight of HAPSI, you really need to have that focus. Okay, thanks, Corey. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, takes care of public comment and uh, takes us to uh, council action, which is before us. Gary? Yeah, thank you. I guess that was my cue. <laughs> um, yeah, as I summarized before, your, um, your main task that is required of this meeting is to adopt a range of alternatives. So this would be the opportunity to either add something into the range, remove something from the range, um, but at the end of today, uh, adopt the range of alternatives within which any specific alternatives will fall. And then the team will come back in June for uh, final action. So this is also your opportunity to, um, to consider what you heard in the AB reports and public comment and in the presentation and uh, think about any guidance you might want to give regarding, um, uh, you know, next steps. Uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a couple of sort of high level topics, obviously, like with HAPSIs, but there's also, you heard a lot of other, um, I think, sort of of less magnitude, but also important um, items that, that were, um, that were, you know, either captured in the AB reports or, um, you know, in other, uh, like in my presentation. So 
uh, that could, I think, fall under council guidance for, you know, next steps. Um, um, but really, that's your, uh, oh, and then, of course, if you wanted to select uh, preliminary preferred alternatives for either alternative one or two, you could, um, you could do that as well. So uh, I think that summarizes the overall action. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, th well, thank you for that. So with that, I will open the council floor for discussion. Brianna. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanted to start off the discussion by expressing my gratitude to um, council staff and um, the EFH team, Dr. Eminis Dorval and Eric Chavez and, and Kim Jacobson, and also um, for their work in updating and providing recommendations for CPS EFH and for drafting the alternative documents. And I'd like to say thank you to our advisory bodies and the public for the additional input on the alternatives document. Thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Anyone else? Car Brady. Brianna beat me to it. That is exactly what I wanted to say. And I think that I probably we probably both speak for everybody on the council. This is a great improvement on, on the tools we had before. And it's obvious that a lot of work went into it. Um, and I also appreciate that. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the work on EFH in particular just feels like a really good, uh, description of the science and my personal understanding of the resource. And, uh, and I have a lot of, uh, comfort in, in, um, a potential vote that I might make in a, a few minutes on uh, putting that forward as, as essential fish habitat for these species uh, in a range of alternatives. And um, so I, I really uh, feel good about that step. I do I just want to acknowledge the discussion on HAPSIs. There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of questions back and forth um, with uh, some of our advisory uh, body representatives presenting reports today and to our council staff, Carrie, on this topic and uh, uh, and in public comment, and I I feel a, a a certain pause in in identifying the appropriate next step, um, given our understanding um, of the resource of squid in particular um, proposed as as. Uh, being subject to a HAPSI designation um, in that we know more about squid than is represented in the alternative and, um, and, and really still are fairly limited in knowing what areas are most important to that species. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to council discussion on that um, topic in particular and really kind of giving us a compelling reason to include or disinclude HAPSIs in the range of alternatives um, or a preliminary preferred alternative this meeting. Thanks, Carl. Anyone else? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I echo what Karen and, and Brianna said about the work for EFH. I think it's it's well well explained. Well, a lot of lot of good advice on that. I also question the designation of hapsies for squid. I mean, I I see the the areas that are being designated as being the really where the fisheries are, and the the major part of the fisheries. I'm I live just outside of that zone, and a lot of squid was caught. A few, over the years in that area, right in front of my house. You know, the folks that were at the house the other night, you could you could hear the the winches running and everything right out in front, and that's rocky substrate that they were fishing on. So it isn't just that. I think squid are pretty opportunistic. They go where they wherever the conditions are right. I I really concerned about uh, you know taking areas that we have a lot of data on and, and actually singling them out. It's kind of the rarity of the habitat type to me doesn't pass that test. It's not rare. It's 
it's they are opportune. And another thing that was brought up there was the 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 fact that squid occur in a lot of places, but they're not close to markets. And they're, you know, they're pretty volatile. You can't carry those for a day and a half on the boat. So they're limited by that as well. So I I don't know that designating HAPSI is really the right way to go. I think it's covered by the EFH. I think a lot of the definitions are there. Um, I also, um, I'm also concerned just because of my personal experience with HAPSIs. When I was fishing in the Bering Sea, Pollock fishing designated HAPSIs that protected uh, skates. And, uh, you know, it was the same thing. Oh, it's just a HAPSI. It's not going to bother you. Well, the next thing you know, it's a no trawl zone. And I worry about the value of those fisheries to those communities that they're based around and, and how, what could happen. Now, I do, I'm very sensitive to the other uses of the ocean, but I'm pretty confident, at least in Monterey, and that there are a lot of protections offered just by the sanctuaries and other, other things that have been, uh, other areas that have been uh, designated. So I, I, that, that's my that's my prime concern. If it was, if we had enough data to call the whole coast hapsi, uh, well, then we might be thinking about it. But then once again, just as uh, Mark Fina pointed out, and if you if it's all critical habitat and the EFH, then it doesn't matter where you do it because it's all it's all there. And so that point was driven home to me on the granularity of the marine planning stuff for, for uh, aquaculture when we had presentations by James Morris, James Morris and his concern was the granularity of the data and that if all, if all the areas are important, then none of them are important. So I, I think of that too. So I would, I, I'm really hesitant to, to adopt uh, alternative two at this time, really hesitant. I, and, uh, I think alternative one really covers it. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Query writing. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll echo everyone else and thanks for all the work that went into this. Um, um, thinking here a little bit about the market squid, HAPSI. Um, this is tough. I mean, the, it's the question about what would be broad enough. Um, and I agree with the comments about we need to think very critically about what a HAPSI is, because as Mr. Fina pointed out, it will lose its meaning if it's applied too broadly. Um, that's what it's supposed to be, and I think that's what it should be. Um, you know, I was thinking on this, and, and this was where I was trying to go with my question on methodology to get a better understanding of kind of how wide of a how wide of a net did the did the science and the folks actually look at this to get a sense of that. Um, I think questions like this are hard because you know we, we won't know the whole EEZ probably ever. You know, that's an impossibly high standard. I, we want to, but we can't. Um, so where you draw the line about having done enough science to make a determination, perfect science, best science available all those lines. And I think ultimately it's a hard question of translating the science into policy. And this is a great case of that. Um, I am reflecting deeply on the fact that the habitat committee and our NIMS coordinator are saying that this does meet their standard. That to me is a high bar. Um, they're providing compelling evidence. So um, I'm just putting that out there as, as some thoughts I'm having right now. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, um, uh, yeah echoing all the thanks. This is, um, and <laughs> focusing on the one issue does not mean um, not recognizing all that, all the value and the other issues that Carrie is pointing us towards. But I would, in, in response, I don't have an answer. Um, but when I hear Bob speak about how that area is important for fishing, I, I kind of think I'm the analogy of offshore wind and what areas would you want protected? Would you want that area protected from offshore wind? I would say you're going to say yes. So then why wouldn't you want 
uh, projects to consider the impact on the habitat of that species in that same area. And then I hear this, yes, we want them to be a particular concern, but um, just because people fish everywhere doesn't mean it's it's not important to fishing and we don't want boom, for example, to consider what the impact is going to be when it puts, uh, uh, considering what it's, what it's doing now and putting off for when. Um, so this idea that it's, yeah, we have the situation where it's EFH is everywhere. We just, and there is going to be, I don't understand the FH consultation, the consultation process well enough. But yeah, as I think Corey said, Corey Riding said the other piece of our, our EFH coordinator is thinking that this meets the criteria and, and that it could be useful. And I'm having trouble um, disagreeing. Um, at the same time, I don't know that we're, that we're going to make much progress between now and, and final action on having more information. Um, but yeah, things that we have kelp, I think, in the ground fish, and this was before my time, but the I think 1990, no, that sounds too early, 1990, 2006 probably was when they designated, um, you know, kelp and all those in, in rocky reefs and all the other, and we, I think they are all important. Um, it's, it's, we don't want a project, yeah, we want them to consider impacts on those habitats, whether they're still, um, plenty of kelp elsewhere on the coast, you still want them to consult and figure out the impacts can be and if it could be mitigated. So those are some thoughts, th some thoughts in my head and um, from my own, my own needing to learn more about how EF EFH works. So yeah, really appreciate the, the way that the um, advisory sub panel, the habitat community and the management team all framed the issue for us to think about and, and the public as well. Thanks, Corey. All right, anybody else? Mo motion? Maybe? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to address the offshore wind question. Um, I believe if we're looking at spawning habitat specifically that that's considered near shore. I think if we were to broaden it to the points that Mark Fina brought up regarding the other life cycle parts, um, juvenile stages, that would be more offshore, but that's not considered the purpose of the potential or proposed HAPSI at this point. Um, maybe, yeah, it would, maybe the analogy was not clear, but I, I do, and this would not be where Bohm would be citing, but it was an analogy. If the same thing were happening in federal waters, why wouldn't, why wouldn't Bohm, we would want Bohm to pay attention to a HAPSI, and we want him to pay attention to EFH, and we want him to pay attention to fishing areas uh, of a particular concern, and just we want to, we don't, we want to know what the impacts were going to be. So, yeah, I didn't mean to be too specific of that analogy, but, um, Generally speaking, that that was that's the thought. And all of you who think about salmon much more than I do, think of all of the essential fish habitat designated in, in in freshwater. And what if it were more effective at, at protecting um, all the things that they, that are affecting your, the salmon runs um, runoff, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Anyone else? Still looking for a motion. <clears throat> if someone's so inclined, or we could take a break, put one together. Karen Brady. I feel like I, I, I do not have one prepared, and I feel like this one could go sideways if it's not prepared already, and so I would request i'd be happy to offer one but i'd like a few minutes to compose it okay so uh, how, how many minutes would you be comfortable with about 10. 10 okay all right let's take 10 minutes and be back here at um 335 6 335 oh <laughs> 2.45. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, yeah that, might be better. that might be better. Sorry. Yes, 335, 336, since I've wasted a minute. 245. 245. <laughs>
Yeah, we're going to wait to, to 251, give uh, five more minutes here. So two, that's what it says on the screen. <laughs> in, two, in 30 seconds. Okay, well, we're back in session. And so with that, I think that, uh, I think we have a motion prepared. And uh, 
and I look to uh, Karen Braby for uh, for that motion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and Sandra, I think you have it. Took a little walk around the council room, but it is here. Um, mm -hmm. I move that the council adopt alternative one with the Salish Sea extension as recommended by the Habitat Committee and CPS management team as the range of alternatives and 1B as the preliminary preferred alternative under agenda item H5. Okay, is the language on the screen accurate? Yes. Very good, I'm looking for a second. Second by Bob Dooley, thank you, Bob. Please speak your motion, uh, Garn. So we, in um, council discussion, I, started by saying we have really great information uh, and improvements on EFH delineation and description uh, in the documents that have been presented to the council today. And I very much appreciate the work that's gone into those and the thought. Uh, and for the EFH descriptions, I think there is clear consensus and support of those uh, being adopted and moved forward. Uh, and, uh, and that includes uh, adopting uh, the appendix under alternative 1B um, uh, with all of the improvements. And there have been multiple, but I specifically wanted to call out the Salish Sea extension um, as part of the input we've heard today. Uh, in contrast, I think I want to start by saying that the council and our advisory bodies and the public recognize and value market squid as an ecosystem and harvest species. It is uh, a very important um, component of the California current system. However, we've heard very uh, good rationale for being careful with the designation of uh, habitat of particular concern, habitat area of particular concern. Um, and specifically for market squid spawning areas, we have evidence of spawning in a much broader range of areas across the full uh, spectrum of our California current system than is represented by the current HAPSI designation uh, alternative. Uh, which is not included in my motion and is designated as 2B. I think the um, calling everything special, calling everything important and uh, critical devalues the areas that are. And I think that we have um, some information in hand that uh, could improve a future designation potentially uh, of HAPSI for market squid. <coughs> Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't feel that that is ready for decision making today, and I think the risk is that we uh, devalue areas unknowingly um, that are more important for the species than are currently represented. And for those reasons, uh, and and also for the the reason that the EFH designation covers the same. Uh, habitat the, uh, down to 93 meters of depth. Uh, that is the HAPSI designation. I feel that area is covered um, by the EFH designation uh, and that the coastwide representation of that, that spawning habitat is more accurate than is the HAPSI uh, designation. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, very good. I open the floor for questions to, or discussion on the motion. Rihanna. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Karn for the motion and that I will be supporting it. Thank you, Brianna. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Garn, I too thank you for the motion. It's very well crafted. Thank you. Um, I agree with your description of the 
alternative two. I think it's uh, you know if everything's if everything is hapsy, I think then <laughs> nothing's hapsy. I also think that it the part that really pushes me to think that we should not be going on alternative two is it's by description of what we've heard it's not rare habitat it is it is all the whole coast is habitat and areas even not included in the 92 meters is habitat to some degree so i don't think it's it, it's the right thing to call it something special even though uh, our advisory panels have um, or a couple of them have said that. I, I don't think that that is what we should be doing. And I, really my take home on this is really contained in the management team report in the last bullet point. Squid are dynamic in nature, will go anywhere, go where habitat is ideal. Moving and adapting with changing temperature conditions. Much of the available data on squid spawning grounds are obtained from areas where significant fishing activity occurs representing only grounds accessible to and favored by fishing boats. As such, other sprouting grounds may exist, we know they do. And designating discrete spatial areas as hapses for squid may not be warranted. And that really, that really pushes me to think that we're premature on this. Maybe at some time in the future, we might change our mind. But right now, I don't think it's critical because I think it is covered by the fact that it's an EFH. And so I agree with you and I will be supporting your motion and thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Karen, for the motion. Um, I will be supporting this motion, but I did want to speak a little bit to what you spoke to. Um, which is that I, I do have some significant heartburn at this point when we are at the range of alternatives um, of taking away the second part around the market squid hapsies. Um, looking at what we heard across reports, especially in the Habitat Committee report, um, as well as we heard from the NIMS coordinator today, um, I think there was some good science presented. Um, I think they made a strong case I 100% um, understand the argument here and the logic that folks are talking to. Um, I just do not feel at this point, I'm not super psyched on not continuing to <laughs> see what could be brought forth in the coming months and have a wider ranging conversation um, at that point about what's in front of us and what the science is really telling us. So thank you for pulling this together. Um, Again, appreciate the staff time that went into this and all the advisory bodies and management teams who took the time to look into this. I just wanted to note that and hope at some point um, there can be a discussion about how we can take the suggestions that were made to us in the various uh, reports about what needs to be done, um, how we could expand that scope um, and come back to look at this because I do continue to think, I think CAPSIs are important. Um, when they are done well. I've seen them be effective for this council and this coast. Um, and I continue to have concerns about um, ocean uses that are not fishing and thinking about what that might be. And um, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Gord. Okay. Corey Niles? Um, yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. If um, if this were um, if we were talking about areas off Washington, I think I would be um, singing a much different tune about um, that they should remain in the range of alternatives at this time. Based on, on a lot of what Corey just said, we've got a team of. Um, scientists put this together for us. We have the Habitat Committee, who is our experts on how EFH works. And they, as a consensus position, are recommending that this would be useful to keep in the range of alternatives right now. Who am I to disagree with that point? At this point in time, I would say I, I'm, I'm not. So I'm, I would, if this were again, areas off Washington, and the evidence suggested that they were important um, and, the, and they were people reading that evidence were saying they were of particular importance. 
I would I don't think I would let the fact that the other areas on the coast had not been looked at yet get in the way of taking advantage of what EFH can do. And again, Habitat Committee is the one that leads us on on the benefits of what EFH can do. So given that these are not areas off of, of, of Washington, I will you know, support this motion and, and, and defer to, to the states with the um, where these areas are. But yeah, I'm a little bit on the rationales given. I'm, I'm again, maybe I'm conflating a, a half seas with EFH, which is essential and it is everywhere and it, and it, and it has, it is getting diluted in its importance. Um, but the important thing is the goal of EFH and making sure that when they're consulting on, on, on other uses of, of the ocean and, and, um, in, in, in habitats that affect salmon, et cetera, that they are looking at the impacts to those habitats and the effects on, on the species. So yeah, while supporting this, I guess, not supporting the rationale or, or the precedent it, it would set, again, if, if these were areas off, off the state I'm here representing. Hey, Corey, Phil Anderson. I have very similar thoughts as um, Corey just expressed couldn't quite figure out how to put them into words. So he did a great job of doing that more articulate than articulate than I could have been. Um, it's, there's a, 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 I, I share the perspective that setting aside habitat areas, of particular concern is a relatively high bar. Um, but given the input that we've had from our experts and our scientists on the subject matter, it seems to me premature to take these off, to take that that is uh, out of the range of alternatives. I would equally not support having them identified as a preliminary preferred alternative either, but to take them out at this juncture, um, I, I'm not comfortable with. Uh, I have a, a kind of the same perspective as, as Corey if they, if these areas were off of Washington and we were in this process, I would be voting against this motion for that reason, for those reasons. But um, given that they're not, I will um, I will listen to the wishes of of the folks that are representing the states off of which these are located. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Virgil Moore. My comment is more a question. I don't think I can add much. Um, in terms of the mixed input we got from our advisory groups and technical and, and other advisory groups, we had one recommendation for including 2A in the range of alternatives. It takes no action, but does it not recognize this as an issue? And, and so I'm asking the question, and maybe Karen, it is to you because you made the motion and I'm certainly not suggesting any changes. I'm just asking the question in terms of that diversity of input we had, recognizing that this is something those folks have said, yeah, but we're not sure because of all of those different things that are out there. What is the effect of including 2A? in our action versus not including it. And I guess that's my question. Thank you. Court. Thank you for that question. I don't feel that I have the expertise to answer that. That specific option was not part of my thinking. The specific thinking uh, in the motion that I made was to not include further discussion prior to the June council meeting where an FPA will be selected on uh, the HAPSI 2B alternative. Thank you, Karen. Anyone else? All right, so the end of discussion. With that, I'll call for the question.
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those no? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Gary? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, as I said at the outset, your um, primary task at this meeting was to adopt a range of alternatives. And if you so wished, you could adopt a preliminary preferred alter alternative or suggest some modifications. So you have adopted a range of alternatives that includes alternative one, does not include alternative two, and uh, it selects uh, the uh, alternative 1B as the preliminary preferred, which is to update the appendix and all those component parts. And then you specifically um, uh, uh, included uh, the uh, inclusion of the Salish Sea as EFH for squid and for the krill species per the uh, recommendations you heard in the advisory body reports. Um, so with that, you... Um, you completed your primary task. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, great work, everyone. Uh, a lot of good information there. And uh, okay, so that takes care of uh, H5. And I think we're gonna go straight to um, G4 in season. We did have a 15 minute break here, so I think we'll just keep going. And we have a little slight break here for seats to change. Um, and we'll just uh, go pause here for a few minutes. Okay, we're uh, back in session here on um, ground fish item G4 in season adjustments. 
and I'll welcome uh, Marcy Rimko and Lynn Mattis to their respective seats. Um, and I'll turn to um, Todd to uh, kick us off. Todd, you there? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Council. As the Vice Chair noted, this is agenda item G4, which is in-season adjustments, final action for ground fish. So under this particular item, the Council is going to consider if any management measures are needed, necessary to be adjusted to achieve but not exceed ACLs within the ground fish fishery. Um, the most recent ground fish landings data are of course available on PacFence's Apex website, but that information will be presented um, in some reports that I will discuss now. Um, your reference materials include two California Department of Fish and Wildlife reports, a GMT report, and a GAP report. Your action is to adopt any 2023 in-season adjustments as necessary. Um, that is my overview, Mr. Vice Chair. I realize it's very short, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Todd. Questions for Todd on his overview? All right, I'm not seeing any. With that, I'll turn to uh, Marcy Yurimko in the Cal Fishing Reports. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, CDFW offers two reports today for your consideration. Um, they're both informational. Um, they don't request or any action of the council. Um, but in our ongoing efforts to keep the council and our advisory bodies informed on our catch tracking in season, uh, we've prepared for you report one, which is the final uh estimates of um, mortality in California fisheries in 2022, and then report two covers initial uh, information on mortality in California fisheries in 2023. So turning to report one, uh, in the recreational fishery for copper rockfish, the final 2022 mortality estimate for copper rockfish in the uh, rec fishery is 63.6 tons. Uh, you'll recall um, back in November of 2021, council recommended in-season action to reduce the bag limit for copper rockfish uh, statewide to one fish. Um, as a result, we've been working under a one fish bag limit throughout 2022 and the statewide total recreational catch was substantially lower than what we had projected it to be. Um, we projected 137.4 metric, metric tons when we first took that in-season action, and the total accrued was only 63.6 metric tons. A number of industry members report successful self-avoidance efforts and CDFW is also aware that a portion of the CPFE fleet is strongly encouraging passengers not to retain any copper rockfish in order to minimize recreational mortality. The distribution of the mortality by the management area and fishing mode is shown in figure one. So if you look at the graphic there at the top of page two, uh, the highest mortality in 2022 came from the southern management area and predominantly in the CPFV mode. Um, and then you can see the relative catch comp um, by mode uh, gray is the CPFV uh, fleet and then private rental boats, um, the next highest contributor there in blue. So turning to quillback rockfish, the final 2022 mortality for quillback was 9.2 metric tons, which uh, actually was above what we had projected would accrue in the 2022 recreational fishery after taking action to reduce the bag limit to one fish statewide. Um, but notably, uh, we did not expect that bag limit reduction to reduce catch quite as substantially as with copper rockfish because um, oftentimes they don't comprise a, a very significant uh, portion of a bag limit. Uh, quillback are a more northerly distributed species. The Mendocino management area had the highest mortality in 2022, uh, followed by the northern management area. And unlike with copper, the majority of the catch was by private and rental boats rather than by CPFVs. Um, 
So that's all shown in figure two. So further adjustments to seasons and or depths in 2023 may be required to reduce mortality on quillback rockfish. Turning to yellow eye rockfish, that's uh, our remaining um, rebuilding rockfish species off the coast of California. Uh, in 2022, we were working under a recreational harvest guideline of 11.7 metric tons with an ACT of 9.2 tons. The final mortality was 3.8 metric tons or 41% of the ACT. So you'll remember back uh, in late in 2022, we um, recommended some changes to the depth dependent discard mortality rates that were developed by the GMT and approved for use in management. Uh, we've now incorporated those new uh, discard mortality rates into our final estimates of recreational mortality. Um, the rates represent the best available scientific information for select rockfish and are an improvement over the previously used surface release discard mortality rates. As expected, applying the new depth dependent rates did not result in a significant decrease to the discard mortality or to the total mortality. The new method was compared to the old method for a number of select species and that analysis is shown in table one. So if you look at um, the species in table one and you can see the original discard mortality and then the updated discard mortality. Um, so the, the ones with the largest change included um, yellow eye rockfish um, close to a ton. And then when you look at copper rockfish uh, statewide, so combining the information for copper rockfish from the north and the south, uh, total savings was about one metric ton, um, which is um, still a, a very small fraction of the total recreational fishery mortality for copper rockfish. CDFW recognizes the improvements to the catch data stream that are brought about by incorporating the new depth dependent mortality rates for the rockfish guilds. However, we would note that additional scientific work on survivorship at depth uh, is unlikely to result in significant increased savings from reduced discard mortality. CDFW will continue its ongoing outreach efforts to increase anglers' knowledge of the effects of barotrauma on rockfish and the benefits of utilizing descending devices. So turning to our non trawl commercial fishery, uh, looking at um, copper rockfish, um, in the northern part of the state, um, the cumulative landings were 0.2 metric tons over what we had projected. If you look at figure three, um, the blue line represents the landings in 2021. And this is before we uh, imposed the 75 pound per two month trip limit. The orange landings um, is what accrued in 2022 under the new lend uh, under the new lim limits, um, and we had projected that the black line is what we projected would be attained. Um, so we were a little over in the north. Um, turning to south of 4010, uh, we projected that the trip limit would reduce the harvest uh, down to. Um, 3.5 tons and in fact we came in under that a little bit for 2022 in total. Um, so the take home message for copper rockfish is that the trip limits did effectively work to reduce the commercial non trawl fishery to um, projected um, attainment um, and and consequently the the um, specifications and measures that um, we were working under. For quillback commercial, um, you can see in figure five, uh, again, the same comparison, 2021 landings are shown by the blue line, and then the realized 2022 landings 
uh, post implementation of the trip limit. Uh, again, for quillback rockfish in the north, um, we came in under the projected harvest and then turning to south of 4010, um, same situation, quite a bit under the projected uh, landings for 2022 uh, in Southern California. Um, so again, just reaffirming that our trip limits um, worked successfully to curtail harvest to um, our predicted levels. Um, one concern that was raised back in 2021 when we were considering these in-season recommendations for trip limits um, that it might be difficult to access the other deeper nearshore rockfish um, that commercial fishers might be interested in targeting and that uh, were available to target um, under their state deeper nearshore rockfish um, permit. Um, so we've been monitoring the um, performance of the other species in this complex, the deeper nearshore complex, and how um, how management um, has impacted um, the harvest of these stocks. And in fact, um, what we found in 2022 is actually the performance on those deeper other deeper nearshore species actually improved over 2021 levels. So it does not appear that the constraints that were placed on copper and quillback rockfish had um, a negative effect on being able to access uh, the remainder of the deeper nearshore rockfish stocks, um, both for Northern California, which is shown in figure seven, and then the same for figure eight. So that's a positive positive outcome for um, ability to harvest the other species that the permit um, authorizes. So then turning to page nine, um, this is appendix, uh, the discussion of appendix one, which is the update of the full uh, 2022 fishing seasons relative to the ACLs, harvest guidelines, sector allocations, and ACTs for the 21-22 biennium. Um, the catch estimates of total mortality for the rec sector and landings from the commercial sector, uh, and that's without discard mortality. Um, commercial landings are from the non-trawl fixed gear limited entry and open access sectors, except black gill rockfish, which include both trawl and non-trawl landings. Monthly recreational catch data are shown from rec fin through December 2022 and show it by month and re reflect the activity across all the recreational management areas in table two. Commercial landings are from pack fin and reflect activity across all management areas from January through December. That's shown in table three. And then table four is the combination of the recreational and the commercial catches. Uh, compared to the federally designated harvest specs. Looking at that roll-up in table four, there are four species line items that reflect overages in 2022, where um, we're comparing the catch to the 2022 reference points. Um, this is for copper and quillback rockfish north of 4010, for quillback rockfish south of 4010, and also for vermilion rockfish south of 4010. Um, those four are all above the respective species specific California contribution to an ACL. Um, to uh, And those ACLs are um, stock uh, complex ACLs. So we would note that these reference points and the fishery regulations have changed in 2023 in response to incorporating the assessments that were conducted in 2021 into the specifications and management measures. So um, just looking at table two, again, these are the recreational catches statewide by month. Table three, uh, we have a look at our commercial non trawl fixed gear landings by month and then table four is the the roll-up of commercial and recreational combined and then the uh, reference point that we're tracking to so that's it for report one for 2022 um i'll go ahead and turn to report 
2, which uh, describes our in-season harvest uh, to date in 2023. Um, table 1 is a roll-up of both the recreational and commercial catches to date relative to the 2023 ACLs, harvest guidelines, sector allocations, and ACTs. Catch includes estimates of total mortality from the recreational sector and landings from the commercial sector without discard mortality. Commercial landings are from the non-trawl fixed gear, limited entry in OA sectors except for black gill. Um, for the recreational fishery, uh, the boat-based fishery opened April 1 in the southern management area, and that um, opening was for all depths. And the next opener will be in the central management area on May 1st, and that will also be uh, an all-depth fishery opener. Um, then um, in San Francisco, um, on May 15th, the fishery will open under the offshore-only provisions, uh, as well as the Mendocino area will off open under offshore only. Um, the northern area will open on that date at all depth. Um, while some groundfish species other than rockfish and link cod are open to boat-based anglers year-round, poor weather conditions during the winter months have resulted in few trips taken by anglers. As of the drafting of this report, monthly surf estimates are available through January 2023, <laughs> and do not indicate significant mortality has occurred on any groundfish stocks. As more data be become available throughout the year, CDFW will provide updates at the upcoming council meetings. For the commercial fishery, landings are from PACFIN through March 27th, and in the first three months of 2023 are a little higher um, for shelf rockfish in the north, uh, a little higher for shel shelf rockfish south and a little higher for slope rock south than at this same time in 2022. Landings of nearshore species, uh, sable fish, thorny heads, and canary are lower than in the first three months of 2022. Quillback and copper rockfish landings continue to decline compared to 2022. The lower than unusual than usual landings could be attributed to unfavorable conditions like bad weather which seem to have been persistent throughout the first three months of the year. So looking at table one, which again is the roll up of everything we have to date in 2023 compared to the reference points, you can see we've got, you know, less than 1% attainment on most of the species because most of the fisheries have been um, closed or constrained by weather. Uh, the one, um, the one area where we have some attainment of significance, uh, you look on the, the far right hand uh, column for percent attainment, uh, quillback rockfish south of 4010, uh, we're tracking to the ACL contribution to the complex. Uh, we do have 0.1 tons accrued against the uh, ACL contribution um, that we're tracking to of 0.9 tons. So we've accrued about 10% to date uh, against that limit. So with that, I'll take any questions on report one or report two. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Uh, questions on the CDFW reports? Lynn Mattis. Uh, I don't have a question. I just want to acknowledge and thank CDFW and their staff for all that went into compiling these tables and putting providing us with this information. I know how much work it takes to make spreadsheets like that, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Marcy. Okay, next up will be the GMT report and uh, Mel Mandrup. Mel, are you there? Hi, good afternoon, Council. We can. Uh, all right, uh, Mel Mandrup here from the Groundfish Management Team reading um, agenda item G4A on in-season adjustments. Um, more of a, an overview for you because there's, there's no uh, action items in front of you today. Um, we just have some informational items. Um, starting off with uh, 2022 sablefish. Um, it appears that we may have uh, approached, uh, possibly exceeded the Northern uh, Sablefish ACL. 
So the, the GMT provides you with their best estimates to date, um, comparing all um, or the, the total estimated mortality from each sector uh, to the, the respective shares and allocations and harvest specifications. Uh, and that is seen in table one. Um, so I'll walk you through this table, it's quite big. <laughs> um, so on the left-hand side there, you have the harvest specification, um, uh, and it flows from the coastwide OFL and ABC down to the um, area management ACLs, and then below those ACLs are the off the top deductions and the uh, respective uh, allocations for each of those management areas. Um, the allocations that um, have been um, designated for those sectors and then the retained weight, um, most of that information came from PACFIN, either the comprehensive FT table or um, the ATC data came from the uh, one of the APEX reports, and then the recreational data came from RECFIN. And then we provide uh, an estimated discard weight, which um, has discard uh, mortality rates applied to them. And these are an average of um, the last three years from the GEM product, so 2019, 2020, and 2021. Um, to get you an estimated total mortality and uh, the percent attainment there. So um, looking at the Northern ACL, uh, we, uh, the GMT is, with their best estimate here is um, projecting 94% attainment. Um, and if you add in the Southern uh, attainment, um, that gets you about 18% of the Southern uh, ACL, but if you combine them, it puts us about 77% of the coastwide ABC and 72% of the OFL, coastwide OFL. Um, again, this is our best estimate to date. Um, the final numbers uh, will come in uh, the September meeting when WICUP um, has their, their total mor mortality reports, but just wanted to provide this to you um, as a reference point, uh, as a reference as we move through the year and um, future agenda items where we're talking about sablefish. Um, one other table for sablefish here is table two. Um, just wanted to give some comparisons between um, the estimated mortality um, from Northern Sablefish uh, compared to the, the, the ACL uh, for the last several years. Um, again, just as a reference of how uh, Northern Sablefish has been tracking throughout the years. And then moving on, uh, there's the 2023 Chinook Salmon Scorecard. Um, nothing uh, big to, to talk about here. We're only at 180 uh, or 899 Chinook. Um, it's still early in the season. Um, not much activity or folks haven't even started fishing yet. So um, still low on Chinook. Uh, similar story for Short Valley here. Um, table four shows the, the scorecard for 2023. Um, only about 31 metric tons. And then um, brings us to the last table is the rebuilding, rebuilding species scorecard. Um, the GMT took the liberty of revamping that scorecard to, to kind of flow in the same format of the scorecards above. Um, and hopefully it's a little bit easier to read through. Um, so uh, I, the GMT will take any feedback if there is any. Uh, I will point out um, in the uh, creation of this and the rearranging last minute of the, the table structure, um, the tracking limit <laughs> uh, of uh, yellow eye uh, for the ACL, it should really be 66 metric tons. I don't want to give anyone any um, heart palpitations there. Uh, so uh, ultimately we're tracking um, projecting 53.7% uh, uh, attainment of the yellow eye uh, ACL. 
but um, yeah, hopefully this table uh, flows a little bit e easier for some folks um, to kind of see uh, where sectors are at uh, compared to the, the reference point that they're being tracked to. Um, you can see in the non-trawl portion of that table, we do still provide the, the projection from the, those non-trawl subsectors um, against their respective HGs and ACTs. Um, and with that, um, I'll take any questions or comments, feedback on the yellow eye scorecard. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Uh, questions for Mel on the GMT report? Lynn Mattis. Uh, evidently, I'm in the gratitude mood this afternoon, but I do want to thank the GMT for going into and looking at the sablefish details. Um, I was alerted to this Saturday afternoon, and I think the GMT may have been alerted to this about that same time. It was something that we had looked into when I was still on the team. We had heard about a little bit back in January, but uh, appreciate the team looking into all of that and providing some information on how it can be rectified. Um, I'm not going to comment on the new yellow eye scorecard as one of the creators of the old one. Um, I feel I'm too close to that one, <laughs> but uh, thank you for the effort um, in clarifying the information for us. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Mel. Next up will be the gap report and uh, Gary Ricker. Gary. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, my colleague. Welcome. We read from agenda item G4A, Supplemental Gap Report, Ground Fish Advisory Panel Report on in-season adjustments for 2023 final action. Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel met with the Ground Fish Management Team to discuss progress of this year's fishery and possible in-season adjustments. The GMT discussion was led by Ms. Melissa Mandrup. The Gap offers the following recommendations and comments on proposed in-season adjustments to ongoing ground fish fisheries. For California copper rockfish, the GAP would like to highlight the extraordinary efforts taken in 2022 by the Sport Fishing Association of California, Coastal Conservation Association of California, Golden Gate Fishermen's Association, and the Coastside Fishing Club to reduce copper rockfish mortality through avoidance, voluntary zero retention, as well as the use of descendant devices. These reduced catches were paired with the newly updated depth-dependent discard mortality rates. The 2022 final mortality estimates for the California recreational fishery are reflective of this reduction in copper rockfish mortality, estimating 63.6 metric ton total mortality, which is roughly 47% of the 2022 CDFW catch projection of 137.4 metric tons. And that would be with the one fish copper bag sublimit. The GAP applauds the efforts taken by industry to reduce copper rockfish mortality in California. And Mr. Vice Chair, that completes our short GAP statement. We'd be glad to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, questions of the GAP report? You sure, Lynn? Okay. All right, well, thank you, Gary. Thank you, sir. You bet. With that, that'll take us to public comment. I think we get three cards, I think. Wait for the screen, two cards, looks like. Okay, with that, we have uh, David Kashida, followed by Merritt McRae. So, David, welcome. Hello, Mr. Vice Chair, staff, council members. My name is David Kashida, recreational angler, angler. <laughs> And I'll be speaking briefly on support of agenda item G4A Supplemental Gap Report 1. I'd like to thank the GMT, GAP, SSC, and CDFW for all their work in this matter. Also, I'd like to thank the four recreational fishing, fishing groups mentioned in the Gap Report. The Sport Fishing Association of California, Coastal Conservation Association of California, Golden Gate Fishermen's Association, and, and Coastside Fishing Club for all their forward thinking and voluntary advocacy work to help the, help the copper and other rockfish populations to not be overfished or exploited to dire levels. The Southern and Northern California CPFV and recreational fleets have tried to voluntarily implement a zero take of copper rockfish 
and descending those that were released. They also have worked with supplying carcasses or whole fish to some coppers, of some coppers that were kept by researchers, so they have fish to use for their scientific needs. We have also supplied information to recreational anglers about the new regulations, including rockfish identification cards, and that when the season is open for fishing over, fishing over 50 fathoms, that no nearshore fish can be kept and that they need to be descended if caught. I hope this is helpful if any future changes to the depth restrictions and retention levels are to be considered. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, David. Uh, questions on uh, David's public testimony? Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, David. Um, I, I don't think I quite caught what you said. You mentioned the importance of um, identification materials to distinguish nearshore rockfish and uh, species of concern. Um, maybe you can elaborate on, uh, are you aware of new ID materials? Are there efforts to pass out ID materials? What, what maybe you can elaborate? Yes, we've been actually distributing it and it's uh, stuff we got from CDFW's website. So the stuff that you're giving us, we're giving it to our anglers. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, David. You made my day. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been we've been making an effort to update our fish ID materials. Um, we're not done yet. Um, we've just completed um, some additional. Um, well, last last spring we produced some new materials on quillback and copper rockfish, and then uh, we just uh, completed some work on um, nearshore rockfish identification to help folks better distinguish those species and. Yes, shelf and slope rockfish coming soon. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? Uh, oh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> David's good to see you. Thank you. I'm going to speak to you, but I know you're representing others too. But I, I really am impressed by the efforts of the of the industry to come forward and to see a problem, work collaboratively with the with the state. To, to work to fix the problem and to identify and help with the what we'll call from our rim rep days fisherman science mm -hmm. and help that too so i think um I, i'm just incredibly impressed i think that uh it, it shows that you know that <clears throat> there's a, a thing saying that if you want something done tell a fisherman you can't do it and i you guys have demonstrated to me at least in in spades that you're you see a problem and you you handle it. So peer pressure works. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? All right, David, thank you. Great, thank you. You bet. Next up will be Merritt McRae. Merritt, are you there? I am, just barely in the nick of time. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Vice Chair Pet Pettinger, Council Members, I'm Merritt McRae, speaking for the Sport Fishing Association of California. Voluntary avoidance of copper rockfish by the SAC fleet and others, and outreach efforts by CCA, Cal, Coastside Fishing Club, and more has had profound effects, vastly reducing copper rockfish mortality in 2022. The Groundfish Subpanel Statement under this item points to the scale of this reduction, just 63.6 .6 metric tons of 137.4 projected for the season. In this effort, not only were copper rockfish avoided, but anglers were encouraged to release these fish, a catch which otherwise tends to be one of the more desirable. And Santa Barbara party boat, party boat clients only retain these fish de destined to become part of the CDFW SAC National Marine Fisheries Data Collection in preparation for the ongoing copper full assessment. Out of Dana Wharf sport fishing, anglers were rewarded for releasing coppers. They were presented with a catch and release hat and a 40% discount on their next outing. Anglers were encouraged to use descending devices and releasing these and other rockfish. The SAC appreciates GMT staff and their development and application of depth-based mortality tables for rockfish. In California, an estimated 19,803 coppers were released. Of these, survivorship was estimated to be 10,579 fish or approximately 53%. The fleet will continue with these avoidance and release efforts this season. The Council and National Marine Fisheries Service Action expanding recreational access into deeper waters will be 
will greatly assist in our continuing efforts to minimize copper rockfish mortality. It provides greater opportunity to target healthy rockfish stocks outside of depths where coppers are most abundant. In this effort, the SAC fleet and recreational anglers hope to maintain copper catches below their TAC and ultimately recover some fraction of the time they are currently denied having rockfish on board while fishing inshore waters. That concludes my statement. Thank you, and I would be glad to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Merritt. Questions for Merritt on this testimony? Marcia Rumko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Merritt, for joining us uh, virtually here today. Uh, you mentioned uh, the opportunities in deeper water and um, that the uh, hope is that by um, increasing opportunities in deeper water that we reduce the pressure on the near shore stocks and particularly copper rockfish. Um, I know I received a number of uh, photos and videos of the Southern uh, California rockfish opener on April 1st. And um, maybe you'd uh, have a few words for us about how that opener went and if in fact uh, we were successful in targeting some of those deeper water species. Marcy, thank you for the question uh, through the chair, vice chair. Um, yes, I have, as a saltwater editor for Western Outdoor News in Southern California, I have received a number of photos. Um, one, one set in particular from past council member, member Louis Zim was uh, quite impressive. Great big uh, sunset rockfish and right from local waters. I watched the uh, AIS feed to see which boats went out and uh, tried to target those fish, uh, most notably on the Nine Mile Bank, Upper Nine Mile Bank out of San Diego. And indeed, one boat was out there and they had some great pictures to share as well. Thank you, Merritt. I think I got a picture of a chili pepper. <laughs> chilies, big sunsets. I heard of banks being caught. Uh, a great combination of, of fish all the way down to slope species. Okay, anyone else? Bob Dooley. I will be quick. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Merritt, I just did want to make sure I extended the same thanks I did to David before you. I really appreciate your leadership and all the others involved. There's a, more than just you two for sure, but it's uh, incredible that the, the work you've done to to raise awareness and, and, and really improve the situation. So, um, and it's great to see, it's great to see the results. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the encouragement. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Barrett. And that concludes public comment, which brings us to council action, which is, what's that? Okay. Anyway, just open the floor for discussion. Nothing's necessary here, but. Okay. Then that is. There's no action under this, but before we close this out and let Mr. Phillips go, uh, I think we should acknowledge that it's his birthday tomorrow. And by doing moving this up, he doesn't have to be on the floor first thing in the morning on his birthday. So happy early birthday, Mr. Phillips. There we go. All right. We'd say happy birthday tomorrow morning, but we can't now. So, Marcy? Thank you, uh, Mr. Weister. Just another um, thought. Uh, I. I want to go back to the GMT report for a minute. Um, I appreciate, um, as always, the GMT keeping us apprised of uh, progress to date on impacts in our groundfish fisheries. And I was just wondering, um, at some, we've had some discussions over the years regarding the Chinook retention. If information can be brought to the council, it doesn't need to be every meeting or anything, but it would sure be nice to know of um, the reported um, occurrences where um, we've encountered and taken Chinook um, as bycatch in our groundfish fisheries. Um, if we can get information on whether those fish were collected for sampling and processing since 
um, part of the goal with this tracking effort is to, to determine the stock composition of those Chinook and coho. So I was just, it, it's not um, something that we need to know about every time, but I know this is kind of an ongoing topic of interest to the council. So I would just flag that and put it out there that at some point, if we could get information on how many samples we've collected, it'd be useful. Thank you. Okay. I, actually, Marcy, I, I do believe they're all sampled, I believe. So we probably just need to ask for the information. At least in the groundfish fishery, the trawl fishery. So, okay. Thank you. All right. I must see a hands for a motion or anything else. So I think uh, I'll turn to Todd to uh, close us out potentially. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Mattis, for notifying uh, the Council of my uh, impending age-related event tomorrow. Um, looking at this particular agenda item, you have heard from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and covered their two reports. You have heard the report each from the GMT and GAP, as well as two public comments. Um, as noted, there was no real action proposed, but and you did have some discussion, so it is... Uh, Believe I believe that you have completed this action or this agenda item as appropriate and can close it out. Thank you. Very good, Todd. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for all the good work. And with that, I'll pass the gavel back to uh, Chair Grolnick for some instructions, I believe. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. I'm going to hand the gavel to Vice Chair Hassemer for an announcement. I guess I should say thank you, Chair Gorelnik, but uh, you passed the gavel, so they're unhappy with me with this announcement. Uh, we're going to come back here at 5 p.m. to take up uh, the last salmon agenda item for today. We need a break so they can wrap up on that. So 5 p.m., we will reconvene. Uh, formal wear is not necessary. Respectable wear is. We'll see you back here at 5 p.m.
the recording has stopped.
This meeting is being recorded. All right, if people can uh, move to your seats, we are ready to begin. And give me one second to bring up my sheets here. Uh, I see we do not have our staff officer. Oh, she's, she's remote, so she is with us. So we are on agenda item E8, further direction on 2023 20, management measures. And I will ask Robin Elke to give us an introduction to this. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item E8, uh, further direction for the 2023 management measures. 
I believe you have the STT there with you and they have a report that's going to update you on the analysis that they have run from the past guidance and look to the council for further guidance. And that concludes my summary. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna look around to make sure there's no questions on the overview. I don't see any, so I will ask, invite Dr. O'Farrell to the table to uh, present the STT report. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. I'll be referring to it, agenda item E8A um, from April 5th, 2023. Um, I'll just cut to the chase, um, looking at table five on page 15, um, a number of bolded values uh, in Puget Sound. Um, still moving on to the next page on page 16. Uh, the Tule Chinook uh, exploitation rate is um, slightly above 38% and bolded. Um, moving on to page 18, um, Skagit Coho remains uh, uh, at 30, oh, over the 35% total exploitation rate ceiling at the current time. And um, tables uh, seven, uh, Table seven is, is as usual um, in there, and we also have the um, appendix tables um, appended to the back as well. Okay, thank you. Questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the STT report? No questions, so thank you. you're free for now. <laughs> Uh, that completes the reports and will take us to public comment. I know we have one sign up for sure. We'll wait a few seconds while that shows up on our screen here. And that is Brian McLaughlin. Brian, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, chair and members of the uh, council, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I live in Portland, Oregon. I fish primarily out of the Port of Garibaldi. I submitted some written comments along with my oral testimony. I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at them. Um, I'm going to try to go through it very quickly and may deviate from that just a little bit to highlight some of my points. As I've stated uh, before, you know, I, I support regulations that are necessary for uh, conservation, but I do not support regulations if I don't think there's a meaningful biological reason uh, to put them in place that restrict recreational fishing. Um, I don't see a meaningful biological reason, nor any reason under the Fishery Management Plan or the Magnuson-Stevens Act to restrict uh, recreational fishing in the Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain area from March 15th to June 16th. I was troubled by NIMS's in-season action to close that area from March 15th to May 15th. And I'm also concerned about the proposed salmon management measures because I think they, in not opening the area from May 16th to June 16th, they are inconsistent with the FMP and uh, with the Magnus and Stevens Act. Again, because I don't see any rational biological need to keep the area closed. I will admit that I have a hard time following the STT report uh, and figuring out specifically how Kalamath River Fall Chinook exploitation rates and impacts and, and harvests are being um, used. I see different things in there and it, it appears that we're applying a control rate, a control rule of 10%. And I'm wondering how that's being divided up. I understand the tribes get 10% or excuse me, get, get to half of that. So they get 5% and that would leave 5% for the non-tribal fishers, which is, which is I don't have a problem with, but of that 5%, what uh, fisheries are getting what percent as far as um, you know, the ocean fishery versus the in-river fishery. The current STT report suggests that 96.3% of non-tribal share is going to the in-river fishery. If it is, if that's not just a placeholder, then I think that violates uh, the national standard four for a fair and equitable allocation. 
Um, if that is just a placeholder and those uh, that share isn't actually being utilized, then I think there's uh, extra allowable uh, harvest that could be used for the falcon to humbug fishery that I'm that I care about. And um, I have some other questions that are outlined in my written comments, but I think it's just very hard to figure out how the how the uh, available impacts are being allocated and utilized if they're being utilized uh, with respect to the STT report on the Klamath River Fall Chinook. Uh, in any event, I do think there's some, I have some concerns about whether the tentative proposed measures may be inconsistent with uh, National Standard 1, the mandate to achieve optimal yield uh, and a number of um, implementing regulations that speak to maximizing the length of re the recreational fishery and also having the recreational fishery encompass at least the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, that's also um, in section 6.3 of the fishery management plan as well. Uh, based on preseason report, tables A2 and A4, it appears to me that uh, opening the Falcon to Humbug recreational season, as I've asked for from May 16th to June 16th, would accrue only two Klamath River Falls Chinook impacts and 40 or so Sacramento fall Chinook impacts. I don't see why two Klamath River Falls Chinook impacts would, would provide a rational basis to keep the area closed. Uh, I just, I think that, uh, you know, that those two impacts could be allocated and, and uh, not cause a conservation issue. Likewise, I think that 40 additional Sacramento River Falls Chinook impacts would be reasonable given the ab available allowable impacts that are shown in the STT report. Here again, the STT report shows that we're using a control rule of a 28.1% exploitation rate and there's over 40,000 fish allowable impacts there. Uh, if that's not what's actually being managed to, then the reports are not accurate and it's kind of misleading for somebody like me that's trying to structure my comments based on that. But that's what it says in the STT report, and that's what it said in uh, preseason report two. So that's what I'm going on. And it sure looks like there's a lot of available, allowable harvest impacts. And therefore, I don't see why they can't be allocated to the uh, falcon to humbug fishery and to uh, comply with the objectives and mandates that I cited in my written testimony. So that's the crux of what I wanted to say. Again, I, I very much appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. McLaughlin on his testimony? And there are no hands here, Brian. So again, thank you. And, and just let you know that um, your written comments are accessible in our public comment portable portal. They are there. So that will complete public comment and take us to Council, any council discussion and additional guidance as needed. So I will look around for hands for guidance. Kyle Addix. Thank you, Vice Chair Hassamer, and thanks to the council for their patience again today. We've had a, a long series of meetings in multiple meeting rooms around the hotel with the USB Washington co-managers trying to um, work on fishery issues that get us down to our exploitation rate ceilings for the list of um, Puget Sound stocks that the SDT reported identified were still over their um, allowable ceilings. I don't have any guidance for council fisheries for the federal fisheries um, that we're here to plan, but we will have a, a number of modeling updates for inside fisheries in Washington. Um, those will not fix all of the, the exploitation rate exceedances that were identified, but I believe they will get us a lot of the way there to fixing many of them. Um, so my s request would be um, for to give us an hour or so to sort of compile those and get those to the salmon technical team, ask them to take a break and come back and, and do another round of modeling for us, even though there are no changes to the council fisheries, there's some significant changes to inside fisheries that will be important for getting us to final action tomorrow. All right, um, so no additional guidance on the federal fisheries there. Is there other guidance? provided and I'm not uh, Joe Oatman 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanted to make the comment that I don't have any further guidance on the Trudy Troll. All right, thank you. Um, let me just pause for one second. All right, with that, um, we're not hearing any further guidance, so I'm gonna ask uh, Robin Elke if there's anything else we need to do here before we close out this agenda item. Robin? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, I think you've done your work here. It sounds like the STT is gonna get some instruction on some of the inside fisheries and they'll take it from there. Uh, we have salmon on the agenda tomorrow afternoon and uh, look forward to uh, talking then. All right, thank you. Any further comments before we close this out? Virgil Moore? And I guess it's a request. We've had a number of folks testify, testify relative to that closure along the Oregon coast. Uh, and, you know, giving us detailed testimony as to they don't understand. I would hope there's some staff person here that can contact those folks or somehow interact with them to explain um, the information. I had an explanation given to me that I'm not competent to reply to, uh, to give out, but it, it seems like we've got a fair number of people asking about that. And it seems like we should have some of our local managers or somebody ready to interact with them on that. Thanks. All right, thank you. Any further comments or discussion? And not seeing any hands, I think that completes our action on this agenda item, which is our last for the day. So we will close that out and I will pass the gavel back to our chair for final action today. All right, thank you very much. Vice Chair Hassamer and Council, we um, completed our work for the day and we're actually knocked out one for tomorrow. So let me turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden for any comments, warnings, announcements, or the like. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, good work today, everyone. Uh, just looking ahead to tomorrow, uh, we did take up in season. Uh, this afternoon, groundfish in season G4. So tomorrow we'll start off with G5, which is sable fish gear switching. Um, and uh, let's see, I did receive another report of another COVID incident. Uh, so we do have testing if people feel uh, compelled to do so. Um, just let us know, but it is uh, here at our meeting again. So just be careful, everyone. And those are all of my remarks, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, Thanks everyone, stay healthy.